Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to legislation of the children. Minutes. I think I'm getting my bit of feedback. Anyway, I'll carry on. Uh, there are no emergency drills planned today. In the event of a fire with emergency, you should vacate the building in an orderly manner to the nearest of their electives and make your way to the fire assembly point in the car park. Recording of the meeting. Can I please ask that the live stream be started and verbal confirmation provided when we are broadcasting? We are live. We are live, thank you. So again, welcome to this meeting of the Children and Young People's Scrutiny Committee. The agenda papers and other relevant information for this meeting are available for public viewing on the Herefordshire Council website. The Council is streaming this meeting live on the Herefordshire Council YouTube channel and also making a recording. The recording will be available via the Council's website shortly after the meeting has concluded. Other attendees are permitted to film, photograph and record our public meeting, providing that it does not disrupt the business of the meeting. If you do not wish to be filmed or photographed, please identify yourself so that anyone who tends to record the meeting can be made aware. One person identifying themselves. Thank you. To ensure that recording quality is maintained, can members please speak as clearly as possible, keep background noise to a minimum, and ensure that your mobile phones and other devices are turned to silent. We have some people joining us remotely today. First of all, we have Councillor Tony Pinkin, a member of the committee. Can you uh, even see us okay, Tony? Yes, good afternoon, Chair. I can see and hear. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Diana Tongbe, a vet lead member for children's services. Can you even see us okay, Diana? Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. I can see and hear. Thanks. Thank you very much. And uh, we've got Tess Burgess, too, of legal. Can you hear and see us okay, Tess? She's just joining us, Thank you. And I see you've got Helen Bannister up there. So, so Helen is the um, Deputy Principal Social Worker joining us for the workforce item, Chair. Okay, thank you. You can hear and see us okay, Helen? Yeah, fine, thanks. Thank you. And in the room, we've got members of the committee, obviously myself as Chair, Councillor Hewitt as Vice Chair, Councillor Hanson, Councillor Graham Andrews as sent his apologies. Councillor Fagan, as you've seen as you know, Councillor Mike Jones and Councillor Summers all in the room. We we'll also have in the room a welcome to Daryl Freeman, Director of Children and Family Services, Matthew Sampson, Interim Assistant Director of Children's Safeguarding, Quality and Improvement. That's quite a good title, isn't it? <laughs> Michaela Lee, thank you, Michaela from the Comms Department, Lorna Simpson, Senior HR Department. And uh, at the top, Jenny Priest and James manage the technology for us. Have I missed anybody? I think I have everyone. Are there any apologies for absence, please? Chairman, I'm very definitely here. Sorry, Jim. I'm definitely here as well. Great. Yeah, I can see you all. Sorry, I can't use part of the committee, but of course, you're non voting, so I should have been clearing, and thanks for reminding me. Councillor Kenyon has joined us. So I'll just leave here then if I'm not needed. You are needed. It's welcome to everyone else, no more than me. You all have my words enough to say, thank you. Carl, could we have any apologies, please? Apologies for having just been received by Councillor Graham Jones, <laughs> uh, Cooperative Member Andy James, Cooperative Member Sam Prattley, and Jane Ellis of Health Watch. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any name substitutes? I don't think there are for the meeting. Item three, declarations of interest. Do any members wish to declare any schedule one, schedule two, or other interest in any of today's agenda items? No, okay, let's move on. Item four minutes. There are two sets of minutes to approve and sign the minutes of the meetings held on 23rd of November and 11th of January, November 2021 and 11th of January 2022. No matters of accuracy have been notified to the monitoring officer. I'll take both together uh, on the minutes of both. Can voting members please raise their hands if they are for the minutes? Against, I think that's unanimous in the room. Thank you. So the minutes of both meetings are accepted and approved. I'd like to make an additional note on co optees. As you know, we've been trying to increase and get our full quota of cocktails in place. Uh, and we're very grateful to those who've been attending so far, although 
Copper can't make it today. But I'd like to update the committee at this point on the actions on the action on commit back for some time. That accompanies a minute, and that is to recruit property positions. We still have some vacancies, but I'm really pleased to report that we are now in the final stages of recruitment for the position of a representative of families who are, have been supported by social workers. We interviewed people yesterday, the Vice Chairman and myself, and we will make a recommendation to legal to bring forward to the next meeting for approval of the recommended candidate. And in addition, the Archdiocese of Cardiff have nominated their representative, Mr. Victor Darren, and both of these will hopefully be able to join us at the next meeting, next meeting where we don't vote and obviously approve their Ooh. option. <laughs> Item five, questions from members of the public. To receive any written questions, but I don't think there have been any other one. Thank you very much. And item six, questions from members of the council. Similarly, no questions of the of councillors. So we go right into the, the business of the day. We've got quite a crowded program. First of all, uh, the workforce support. This is provide the committee with an update on the workforce stream of the Children's Services Improvement Plan, phase one, which includes an overview of workforce data. And before we ask the officers to report on that, I think we just want to put a word in. This is the first workforce report scrutiny I've looked at. Certainly, I think in a seal of times, I don't think in the past, has it? I've probably not looked at workforce particularly. But it's all part of our agenda to do more bottom up scrutiny than we traditionally done. And it, so it's great that we're getting this report. So it's the first. It's setting a benchmark for us to look at. We will obviously be coming back to more workforce scrutiny in the future. But this just gives us a, an overview of where we are, some of the issues concerned. And I would like to invite Laura and I gather you're presenting it, are you? It says here. No, Gary, you're going to. I'd like to ask Darrell if you'd like to present your report, to please. Uh, thank you, Chair. And I'll just, I'll just introduce the report and then I will hand over to Lorna and, and colleagues. Uh, so as you said, this is the first time that we've prevented, presented uh, workforce-related data. And you'll note from the paper and appendices that the scope is broad. Some of the messages in this report are uncomfortable. There is reality and truth in some of these messages. And we're working hard to support and develop our workforce whom we recognise as our most valuable asset. It is a benchmark, and I would welcome your consideration of how we can together explore some of the issues raised in the future. The service and its workforce was rocked by the High Court judgment last April, an event that triggered a wave of activity and change that continues today. The impact has undoubtedly been unsettling for our workforce, who have seen changes in leadership and service direction, and who have had different and increased demands on practice and performance, all this whilst operating within the context of a global pandemic. Within our workforce, we have many permanent colleagues, as well as local colleagues, many of whom joined us within the past year, as we have had to quickly increase capacity across the service. Having already said that last year was very unsettling, there are now signs that things are settling down. Where we had been seeing resignations, this has slowed down considerably, and feedback from our staff reference group and from practitioner and manager forums is increasingly positive. We are focused on introducing a range of initiatives, which come together as our new workforce strategy. This suite of documents include the draft retention and recruitment framework and the draft ambitions paper that are included in your packs. Other elements of this framework include the support arrangements for newly qualified social workers and a career progression scheme for social workers that we plan to introduce in April this year. Feedback from our inter exit interviews and other data is informing this work. I've personally made it a feature of my leadership that there will be no bullying on my watch, as I recognise that there was a bullying culture in some parts of the service in the past, and my leadership team are leading by example, working in a restorative manner, both with our colleagues and with those who use our service. Retention and recruitment is an extreme, in, a, in an extremely competitive market are extremely challenging for us. Uh, and social workers continue to feature on the UK national shortage occupations list. Whilst we're able to recruit newly qualified social workers fresh from university, recruiting more experienced workers, which is a key to our improvement, is more difficult. Recruiting locum colleagues is also more difficult as more local authorities are recruiting whole teams of workers as they respond to increasing demand or adverse events in their own areas. Successfully negotiating an exemption from the regional memorandum, memorandum of understanding, which is a document that caps agency pay across the region, uh, has alleviated the pressure a little in the short term. But even this week, locums that we had thought we had signed up were divided to other local authorities by other agencies, by their agencies. 
From April, I'm subject to final sign off. We propose to open up all of our locum and interim post permanent recruitment, which again is feedback from our staff groups so that they felt they weren't able to access some of those posts. Uh, and with a recruitment campaign being launched in community care and through other media. Um, with our colleagues in HR and across the council, we are developing our offer for staff, including reviewing pay scales where this is appropriate and explore, exploring staff benefits, which we hope to introduce later this year, as well as addressing issues and messages that come out of our practitioner forums. Uh, in a moment, then I'll hand over to Lorna and to colleagues. We're joined by Estee Renton, who's the manager of our Social Work Academy, and Helen Bannister, who's our deputy principal social worker. Uh, and they'll, uh, Lorna will take you through uh, key headlines from the paper uh, and, uh, and answer any questions or comments you might have. Thank you, Daryl. Uh, I think it's really important to note that we know in our move to be more bottom up in looking at the issues on the ground, as it were, than traditionally looking down from the higher level perspective, there are going to be uncomfortable things that are being raised, which we know need to be raised in order to make sure our improvement plan works. So, I mean, all credit to you and your pump for having excellent interviews that have some quite sensitive issues on them, but one of which you addressed in, in your report. So I hope that's reassuring to members of the public that we are determined to make sure that issues like that, when they're raised, are not hidden, that they're explored and, and they're discussed. So thank you for that openness in issuing a report, which includes all that detail. Councillor Kenyon, you hold your hand up. Uh, yes, thanks, Chairman. Before your comment comes in, I'd just like to raise again. Um, I, I'd say it's an actual crisis. It's not a, it's a recruiting crisis. Mm -hmm. It's at that level. It has been for a long time. And of course, you're, you're not going to have any shortage of newly qualified social workers going to the Jordan because they have to spend one or two years being supervised and then go off and they can jump on this, um, let's be a local and get paid a lot more. We, I've said this time and time again, until we actually address this by growing our own social workers, running our own courses, and, and I say breed our own, but uh, run our own courses. We can do it in Hereford. We need to start it now. Um, uh, with all due respect to the um, latest um, head of service, um, I, I don't know how long you're going to be here before someone else offers you money, off you go. That's what's happened over years, year on year on year. So I'd like, I don't get a commitment from anyone, really nowadays, but I can understand why social work is holding out. And offer them more money, better pay, let's have this, let's have that. What do you think about the people who are actually doing that at the moment? If someone else comes in and gets offered better terms, it's not fair. And what culture are you creating? So I say this is a crisis and we need to start growing our own now. And I, I don't want to listen to any more. We'll try to understand why we're hearing the same thing. Um, and I'm just going to state, that, state this now that we need to start growing our own. That's certainly a consistent message you've. You've said all along, uh, Councillor Kenyon, so appreciate that. Do you want to make any comments on that now, Darrell, before we go into the report? Uh, I, uh, I don't agree that we're in a crisis right now, but I do agree that this is, um, this is a issue that is bigger than Herefordshire alone, uh, and that we need to take whatever steps we need to do to grow our own and to recruit. Uh, we also uh, would hope that uh, government listens to lobbying from local authorities and from professional bodies uh, uh, where social workers haven't benefited from the same support and recruitment over many years um, as for example teaching colleagues and nursing colleagues and the like have I think there are, that's, that's not me making a political point that's, just, that's a general observation based on 30 years in social work uh, and my role is permanent so I'm not about to be poached by anybody else and I signed up because I am genuinely committed to uh, it were leading and improving children's services in Herefordshire, and I intend to see that through. Okay, Daryl, Councillor Sam, do you want to do that before we get into the report? I'm just trying to speak loud because it's not working. Uh, Thanks, Matt. Let me see if we can get his microphone. Right. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm afraid, can everybody hear me? Yeah. It's not just money, although money is a big thing, um, but people that care do care. And one of the problems they've got, I've, I've noticed when my mother was alive, was that when carers are so restricted on what they do when they call on a patient, that they just get to say, why, why am I doing this? Because I can't do what I need to do for those, for my patients and for my people. So I think we need to look at that end of it too, not just the financial end of it. We need to make our carers know that we 
what to do care, and we're fairly flexible in, in that care. If we don't do that, we're going to lose people and we're not going to keep them. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I trust we can have the head to present the report and maybe press that very quick. Thank you, Chair. So, Daryl's already given a really comprehensive um, intro to the report, but just to draw out some of the, the key points in there. So, the purpose of the report is to provide the committee with an overview of progress against the workforce work stream, which forms part of the Children's Improvement Programme. The workforce stream is one of five work streams currently, um, and that reflects the fact that workforce and, and those aspects are seen as a key enabler of the improvement journey. We're in phase one of the improvement plan at the moment, which runs until the 31st of March this year. The real focus is on putting the foundations in place. Um, so, so picking up on the point that Daryl made, it, the issues that we're experiencing at the moment from a workforce perspective haven't happened overnight, essentially. Um, they, they haven't sort of sprung up since last summer um, when the DFE issued the notice to improve um, and so on. So this is about us sowing the seeds um, and trying to get the basics right so that we can build upon that and develop the culture in the way that it needs to be developed. And, and we're working hard to start developing that. The workforce paper includes a range of workforce data. Um, it is very broad, as we've said. So, you know, we, we can talk through that and I'm happy to answer any questions that I can. Um, if there's further information that scrutiny are looking for today, then I can provide that after the meeting. Okay, I think those are the, those are the key things that I wanted to draw out, really. There's, there's a lot of information in there and we'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Can I answer? I'll shout. I was... Uh, something we must change is this uh, gender workforce mix. 86% female and 14% male, that's, it's not a good thing for, you know, for the, for the young that they're looking after, the, the, the young children, male children. Um, we need to get that, we need to get that sorted. So I guess you might have a question about what is being done to try and make the gender mix more proportionate. Yeah. yeah. And um, so Herefordshire fares better than uh, many other local firms in terms of actually we, we've got a higher proportion of, of our workforce that is, is male than compared to uh, the national profile. Um, you're right, uh, councillor, that that's fact in terms of the profile of, of, of care is it's predominantly seen uh, and perhaps stereotyped, but certainly seen as a female role uh, and, and, uh, and you tend to see that across children's and adult services and a range of the care sector you see that more and more of the workforce is, is uh, female. Uh, on one level we should be very proud that the vast majority of our leaders and managers uh, are women in the service. I think that brings uh, uh, strength in any case to the service. Um, we are trying to recruit a more balanced and representative workforce. That's not just about uh, gender, uh, that's about um, uh, ethnicity and culture and a whole load of backgrounds in it. And we will try to reflect that in, in our recruitment campaign that launches next month. Um, we, we will also obviously um, predominantly recruit locally. Um, thank you. It's a challenge. I see Councillor Fagan, you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and I apologise if, if this is in the papers, but I'm just curious about the newly qualified social workers uh, going into the academy ra um, rather than uh, sort of directly into the, 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 the work force team what sort of what the difference is how that's what difference that change will make uh, thank you councillor so um a newly qualified social worker has a year uh post qualifying as an assessed and supported year in employment and during that time uh, they generally have a lower caseload and higher levels of supervision recognizing it's quite a transition to come out of university and then into the workforce uh, that's part of a national uh, framework of best practice. In Herefordshire, uh, the practice has been that those workers went straight into teams. So essentially, if, you, if you're a team of five social workers and one of those social workers is a newly qualified social worker, it's, it was, it's been historically really difficult to protect that worker's caseload because as work comes into the team, uh, they, they start to assume a caseload equivalent to more experienced colleagues. 
So uh, that's re that's recognised by us that we haven't actually given newly qualified social workers really the best start to their careers in Herefordshire. So taking those workers out of the establishment, holding them in the academy means they'll spend time throughout the year embedded in teams, but they'll be able to come out, reflect on their practice, undertake learning and supervision. Uh, and then only when they've successfully completed their assessed and supported year in employment will they then drop into the establishment and assume a full caseload. So it affords a much better quality of practice and support for newly qualifieds, gives them a better start to their professional career. So, uh, happy to answer, yeah, thanks. I just wanted to find out, has that already begun? Is that practice in place now? Uh, that practice starts uh, as of the 1st of April this year. So we're just putting in place the infrastructure around that. Although certainly since September and October last year, through the Academy and to rest of his team, we've been providing much more support to our newly qualified social workers that are in different parts of the service, uh, recognising that that had been their experience prior to then. Thank you. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just listen to your colleagues. Um, when you said that uh, you're working hard to address the situation, what does the working hard actually mean? What are you actually doing? With regard to which bit, City Council? Well, the, the crisis in recruitment. Uh, so we have, uh, so we've, we've reviewed uh, and are reviewing still. Uh, all of our terms and conditions, our job descriptions, our pay offer, our learning and development officer, and all the things that, that workforce surveys uh, nationally and locally tell us that people value in terms of uh, staying with an employee. We've, we've set up a range of retention interviews with social workers to understand why they stay with us and what they value about working in Herefordshire so that we can uh, kind of double our efforts there and do much more of that. Um, we have we are positioning ourselves to be more competitive uh, against some of our neighbours and other regions. Again, what I can't do is change that external market. I mean, notwithstanding that I agree with you, we need to do more to grow our own. Um, we are working with local universities to see how we can increase the number of uh, step up to social work students, social work students, uh, newly qualified social workers and apprenticeships. So they're all part of the workforce strategy that's being developed at the moment. Um, so there's so working hard covers a lot of issues there. There are no overnight fixes to this, unfortunately. Um, and um, the challenges that Herefordshire and many other local authorities have at the minute have, uh, have evolved over many, many years. Okay, thank you. Just to come back on that, um, how many uh, new qualified um, social workers come from, from Birmingham, West Midlands area uh, to come and work in Herefordshire? Because they're coming in. Because I, I do know that after 12 months, once they've got their ticket, they can go and flog themselves back where they live uh, as a qualified social worker and earn £10,000 straight away more than they can do in Herefordshire. So that is the problem. We need to have these people coming through in Herefordshire that aren't going to be tempted off into the West Midlands for additional money because Herefordshire is a wonderful place to live. It's a, it's a, it's a great place to work, um, but not if you're not from around here. What about word and you get 10 months working at home? So that's the long and short. Of it. We need to start growing around. I can't emphasize this enough because I don't think that's that's what we should have come up with straight away. We are going to start growing our own and, and making sure that people want to live and work in Hereford. Because if you continue to do the same thing, I've been saying this for boring people for probably 10 years. Okay, I'm still boring people now, but if people listen and do this, grow our own. We won't have a problem. We'll beat the national issue by growing our own. Uh, and um, uh, obviously, you'll appreciate I've come in late, in, late into that uh, that ten year uh, conversation. But um, yeah, so we are. I would say, and I do believe, we are doing much more to grow our own I mean, in terms of developing opportunities for apprenticeships and uh, students. Um, I think we will need to also consider where there's a national shortage of social workers, and it's not just about the social workers of the future, it's the social workers now. We, like other um, local authority children's services, will similarly have to consider what is it that we do that definitely needs a social worker and what is it that we do that might be done by people with other skills, backgrounds and qualifications uh, and start to think about should we be recruiting more uh, business support colleagues in terms of some of the data entry, family support workers, personal advisors and the like. So we're, we're struggling to compete in a market that is in itself limited 
notwithstanding that we can grow more opportunities for the future. And we need to be, uh, when we're in a slightly better position of strength, we need to be uh, looking differently at recruitment because not all of what happens in a children's service needs to be done by a social worker. Thank you, Daryl, and I really appreciated your introduction to this. Um, I'm going to try and roll a few things into one. Is the Social Work Academy a virtual thing or an actual thing? Is it staffed by people? And the reason I asked is that I thought, oh, I've never heard of that. So I went online to look. And what I found was pages and pages of PDF things that you could go and refer yourself to, to um, gen up on one aspect of social work, another aspect of safeguarding or this or that or the other. It's actually out there online. So I just want to know whether it's <laughs> what it is. So, so perhaps, in, uh, thank you for the question. If I introduce Esther, Esther Renton is the team manager of our academy. Um, she could perhaps say a little bit more. Is she still there or she dropped off? I can't see. Her. She might have dropped off, in which case I'll ask perhaps Helen <laughs> to say uh, something about the Academy. So the Academy is a real team. Uh, there's a group of people which I think somebody will uh, introduce in a moment. Um, but obviously a lot of their activity during COVID and in the last uh, 18 months has been virtual. Part of their role is to coordinate um, uh, all the learning and development opportunities for the whole of our workforce. So that's where you'll find a lot of resources online, but they facilitate a lot of groups and activities, group supervision, uh, training events and the like. Uh, I don't know whether Estee has managed to get back on or not. Uh, Helen, if you're there, do you want to just say a little bit about the Academy in terms of its... Yeah. Um, yes. Can you, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, thanks for the opportunity. Um, Esto sent her apologies. She had troubles with her um, technology. It's kept kicking her out. So, so um, I think she thought that she was perhaps causing issues if she carried on trying to come on. Um, yeah, the academy are are real people, and it's an then nationally, um, academies have developed in different ways, um, and in some ways our academy, you know, um, will benefit from further mm -hmm. development. Um, but Esto has been in post um, for several months now, really trying to sort of make the academy more robust. So we've got advanced practitioners um, in the academy who support the newly qualified social workers. Um, there are challenges around the role within the with um, their, the apprenticeships that we're a part of the improvement sort of work that we're doing. Um, so on a day to day basis, they will they are. Um, supervising and supporting those newly qualified social workers and partly it's their um, experience um, of, of providing that support that has informed this report and this recommendation in terms of um, having a pr more protected arrangement within Herefordshire which we think will be really it will put us ahead of the, um, the game and compared to some other authorities so we think it's a really exciting idea um, that's been that's been put forward um, from April um, because that means that, that, that it, they will be more protected and they'll have opportunity to move across teams and get a more rounded experience before they make a decision about which team they, they, they move into. Okay. In no, terms of the, it. sorry, I was just going to add, in terms of the sort of resources that you've seen online, that's another area that's underdeveloped in terms of um, the, resource for, the resources that are available um, for social workers, but that's also part of the role of the academy to make sure that all the workforce um, you know, have development opportunities um, and also have, have uh, resources that they can that they can look at. And so we're developing, Daryl's sort of been leading on that in terms of improving um, the resources that are, are available for, for all our workforce. Yeah, that's really helpful because I was going to come back with lots of those PDFs are out of date information and uh, could, they need to be um, uh, cleansed in some way and new material put in. So that you know that would be really helpful if that website was um, was um, bulked up and uh, made more robust and more visible. I just wanted to ask one final question about Social Work Academy because it seems to me that um, how we treat our young people when they come into the workplace with their strong ideals and their drive to make things better, they don't really come into social work for the money, let's face it. I mean, otherwise um, they go in another direction. They come in because they have a vocation. And the idea that we're nurturing them really robustly should then feel 
a ripple effect for the whole of the workforce team. And I want to know how you think we're going to be better than our neighbouring authorities in this respect. Well, I think that in, um, it's a mixed picture at the minute and, and in some authorities in the region are ahead of us in terms of their sort of well-being strategy. Uh, but it's an area that, you know, we need to give priority to in Herefordshire. We've got staff that have suffered trauma um, and, we, and that's part of the recovery work that we've been trying to do. Um, and I completely agree with you about newly qualified social workers. Some of them are very young um, and that's why the... the um, member earlier who referenced about homegrown um, and growing your own staff and bringing in uh, people at a later a different stage in their lives I think I agree with him is is, is a part of the future answer in terms of uh, the national social work sort of re recruitment and retention issues I mean people that have got life experience more life experience when they when they start um, and when, when they qualify um, and, uh, and it's really um, important. But in terms of your answer, um, question about the nurturing, I think that's we can say that about all our workforce that that people need to feel good about coming mm -hmm. to work and they need to feel supported in whatever role they do within a local authority. And that if you were talking to, I could be you know talking about teachers, or social workers, you know, or healthcare, or, or all the people in the roles, different roles with the, in the council about how important it is for people to be supported, how important it is for people to not be bullied at work. Um, that they feel that they have a safe space and so that's one of the things that we've done for example with the retention and exit interviews is to try and create safe spaces for people um, but we need to provide those safe spaces for them that's why we're trying to improve supervision and the quality and quality and frequency of supervision um, for our staff um, so we've really, got a range of things in place yeah it's really excellent evidence that you're giving me which i searched for in the report but didn't find that you're very aware that we need to be doing that relationship nurturing and um i looked pretty hard in the report but i saw things like um lease cars and um, unique selling points and this that, and the other and my challenge to to the directorate or to all of us is that actually the thing that retains staff is relationship and there were some really serious things that came out in the exit interviews. And I, and I, having had a conversation with um, the director, Daryl, just, just now, I, my, my challenge was that those voices in the exit interviews are there to be amplified. And actually putting them in the public domain does yeah. amplify them. But I think we have work to do as a scrutiny yeah. looking in more um, deep to look in more detail at what we can do to address um, workforce retention in terms of boosting relationships. So I'd like that to go down as a recommendation, please. Thank you so much for what you said, though. It was great. Thank you, Jenny. And thank you, Helen. Councillor Summers, you're next. Thank you, Chair. Um, Darla, it seems you can't win for trying at the moment, so good luck with all this. Um, it seems that uh, there seems a, a, a lashback on whether you're hiring men, women, or ethnic, uh, etc. I think the, the key here is that we need people that care. It doesn't matter who, where you're from, what your, what your ethnic background is, or whether you're a man or a woman. If you care, then we need you. And I think I've seen in the past, because I'm Getting, getting on in years, where we've lost some pretty good people uh, because they didn't fit that spectrum that we supposedly should have and to make the left wing happy. So I think the main thing is that we have people that, that care. The other thing is we probably have to do more with, with uh, I'm not saying we should give everybody a car, but we need to do more about making it easier for our carers to get from body to body because it's getting more and more expensive to do that. It's also possibly more dangerous. So I think we have to look at a travel ban for our carers. Anyway, that's enough for me right now. But I really think that uh, we have to look at people as they are, not because of, of their gender or ethnicity. Uh, if you care, that's who we want. Thank you. David, uh, Councillor Jones. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, so I think in terms of you're you're absolutely right. Um, this is a difficult job uh, that people do, and and uh, and we should uh, both set our high standards in terms of the type of candidate we want, or whatever their background, 
uh, but also the fact that we should set ourselves up as an employer of choice going forward. So we want to be recognised as a caring employer, as yeah. well as an employer of people who care. Um, you know, travel, you can't be a social worker or a family support worker or a personal advisor in this county without needing to use a car, um, such as the, the, the rurality of, of much of our county. So that's something that our HR colleagues with our workforce are exploring at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that, Councillor Jones. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I welcome the um, feedback from the exit uh, interviews. Would it be possible to put some figures on those? Because it's, it's more qualitative than quantitative. And you might be going to do that anyway when um, as time allows, because it's, it's, it's new. But it just be, you know, on, the, on the, the last set of figures, there's 15 responses. And it'd just be nice to know if there was, you know, 100%, because there's not that many um that were done but it would just be nice to know if it's 100 percent sort of um complained about pay conditions or was it just no. one or two of each so um on that and uh can i just ask it, who is actually is it human resources that's carrying out the exit interviews or it's not it's not social workers themselves that, how much time does that take as well okay so with the exit and retention interviews um, what we've piloted through the autumn and the winter is, is a new system in children's services. So across the council, there are the online exit surveys that, that colleagues are prompted to complete whenever they're put through as a lever on the HR system. We wanted to bolster that in children's services to give people um, that greater voice. So those are offered on a one-to-one -one basis and they are offered. We can't compel people to have them. Um, but obviously what we will do is it's, it's about how we bolster that offer and how do we communicate that better. Um, the sessions are offered either on a one-to-one -one basis with somebody from the HR team or with the principal, um, assistant principal social worker. So that's how we're running them at the moment. As part of the proposal for how we continue those exit and retention interviews, we're looking at actually where should that sit longer term. Um, partly on the theory that actually if we're going to promote these more we, we we need more resource around it and we want to make sure that we're giving people as many options of how they access those interviews as possible recognizing that not everybody will feel comfortable with sort of having two routes in at the moment so that's something that we're looking at um, in terms of the breakdown of the data obviously what we've got to do to, to gain trust from staff and maintain that trust it's really important that we present data and we share it in a way that can't identify individuals um because i think otherwise that would start to erode that and that's what we're trying to build and strengthen um but we will look at a recording system so at the moment it can be managed fairly locally but we are looking at how we put a, a recording system around it which would enable us to draw more data um, from there whilst protecting individuals confidentiality as well Okay, yes. can, can I just say one thing about um, graduates as well? Um, uh, on and on from Councillor Kenny, and it is that I was a graduate. And what you find with graduates is once they get a job after they leave um, um, education, they take a job because they what they can get. And then if you if you did some analysis about if two years after they took that job. I would say about 80, 90 percent have, have left. And it, and that happens across all sectors. Most people go into a job and then they, they stay there and they get offers and they're uh, when they leave and they, they, they're looking to get some money and start, but um, they're not looking long term at their first position once they graduate. And it, it happens across all sectors. Okay, thank you. Can I you? Yes, thank you. Yes, my, that's very true. Um, I have several things when I'm talking about, I don't want, necessarily want it to be gender equal, the, the workforce, but it, it's I'm thinking I'm coming from the child and 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 a, and a male child can relate to a male. So it doesn't matter who it is, but I think it would be it would be great if we had some more males in the post. Um, and it's, there's an awful lot of, so much about, we will do this, we will do this, we will do this, but we've got them now, it's the children now, where, where, you know, where are we getting 
with them now. Um, and also just a quick question, where do the advanced practitioners come from? Are they part of our regular staff? As, so most of our advanced practitioners are our permanent staff. Uh, the, in terms of some additional teams that we added last year, um, some, of, some are locums. Uh, we've recently put four additional management practitioners into the assessment team um, teams. Uh, they were locum, but as I said, at the intro to, to um, the paper, all of our interim posts will be advertised as permanent posts from the beginning of April this year. So that will allow uh, some of our workforce who wish to progress into those roles or to move teams uh, to do so, and also for us to go out actively to recruit permanently to vacancies in the service rather than maintain them as interims. Okay, thank you. Councillor Summers, you had another question, I think. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Daryl, uh, can you tell me how close you're working with perinatal and other um, entities for new mothers, etc.? Because uh, I know that uh, all new mothers are, as I've seen quite often, actually, UK has a, has a very good response to that. Um, but I, that's where we need to start as far as care is concerned for, for young people. That's what we're talking about today. So. How much uh, do you have to do with perinatal? So um, I guess slightly, slightly, slightly aside from, from workforce, but, but in terms of we're working closely with uh, perinatal and, and, uh, and a range of other health services at the moment, particularly through the auspices of the Safeguarding Children Partnership. So obviously we are with health services, one of the two of the three strategic partners. Um, so quite a lot of work at the moment. We are doing quite a lot of work on um, developing pre-birth assessment uh, and engaging through uh, early health services and talk community uh, and those talk community hubs with families uh, in and, uh, and young mothers uh, in, in communities rather than and hopefully before they come to our services. So certainly happy to talk about that in more detail uh, in, at a future agenda item. Okay, thank you. Are there any more questions? Can you um, just a few reflections, really. Um, so um, I'm thinking about career progression and um, following on from uh, what Mike here said, um, that are we, could we consider working out a career progression programme which worked with another authority so that, so that, you know, I, I mean, I really like the idea with the newly qualified social workers that they can get experience in different parts of the directorate and then choose where best to go. But in that choice, it's quite often a Hobson's choice. They might be torn between one department and another. And possibly if we can get a, a system going where, you know, we could have someone from, I mean, I know that the aim is, you know, that children's cases, the handover between key workers, children's cases will be significantly reduced. And we don't want to increase that. But then we also do want to increase this idea of we're growing excellent with an excellent partner. So we have Telford and Reef as our partner. So that's one challenge. As far as the um, exit interviews are concerned, um, are we considering at all using an independent interviewer? Because I actually think that we would get possibly a lot more people coming forward who would feel comfortable to come forward um, you know, and give us the benefit of their experience and, and ideas where we might improve. So those are two things that I like. That's a key question that we, we said we'd like to see activities conducted that way. So yeah. interesting in your answer. So I'll let, I'll let uh, Lorna speak to the, to the second question. In terms of partnership with other local authorities, um, so what we want to create here, um, and, and there's a culture and a behaviour change in some of this, so again, it doesn't happen uh, overnight, but is, so we're definitely partners, as you said, with, with Telford and Rekin. Uh, we're also uh, developing uh, good and positive relationships with some of our other neighbour lo local authorities, where we invite them in to come and see what we do and for us to go and see what they do, so that you can share and foster good practice across uh, different local authorities. Um, we're seeing uh, more of that, happy to see a lot more of that. Um, and uh, what we don't want to do, of course, is, uh, uh, is create an opportunity for people to say, oh, look, it's <laughs> wonderful over there. But, uh, but we, want to, we, we want to position ourselves as, as one of the best employers in the region going forward. And we acknowledge we're not there at the moment. Um, so uh, certainly uh, Matthew's doing some work with Telford and Rekin um, 
as, as partners, our sector-led improvement partners. At the minute, uh, I'll let Lorna speak to whether or not we, in the future, uh, independently facilitate data interviews. At the minute, we give people who um, <clears throat> who uh, want to leave us, uh, or either thinking of leaving us or have made that decision, uh, a choice. So they can go to HR colleagues, they can go to somebody in the service, they can go to somebody else in the council. Uh, so I, I myself, uh, periodically do exit interviews because that works best if we can speak to the director. I've got an exit interview scheduled for tomorrow from someone um, that uh, has asked because they want to have that exit, exit interview with me as opposed to with somebody from HR or others. I think what we need to do and what I want to do is create a culture, an environment where people can go to whoever they feel safe or whoever they feel they want to be listened to by. But I'll, I'll hand over to Ron. Thank you very much, Carol. Oh, sorry, so you the answer on the um, external interview. Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah. So I think, you know, where we are is, uh, for me, every option's kind of got to be on the table. Um, so, so we'll definitely note it as an option. I think, like Daryl said, that that's where my view would be at, is it, it's how do we create that culture internally? Um, and what we've seen with the retention interviews, we've, we've had some real success, and it doesn't sound like high numbers. Um, but we had some success in the, over the winter where we retained two social workers who had handed in the notice or we were on the cusp of handing in the notice. So there's something as well about making sure that those interviews are with the right person in that moment and somebody where they can, they can act on what's coming out of those fairly quickly because um, we couldn't have taken our time in that, that situation. If we had have done, we, we would have lost those people. I'm sure we would have. Um, so it's just, you know, so I think if it's, if it's an option, how do we make it as slick as possible? Um, yeah, just to come back on that a bit. So at that point, you're the rescuer. So you manage to resolve the situation. But what then, what, what has to happen from that is that resolution needs to be passed back so that they go back to an indifferent different embedded framework than the one that they experienced, which made them feel as if they were leaving. How, I mean, I think this is an inquiry that we need to dig deeper into because I think we need some idea of the sorts of issues that come up in that situation and how, how the management is dealing with those issues. What extra training or resource or awareness are they putting into management teams? so that we don't have people considering leaving. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? Can I have one more? Then yeah, I just Councilor want- Councilor Tambridge, do you have any thoughts before we look into recommendations? Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to say, I think it's much more important they're internal than external, the, the interviews, because the people they're talking to know exactly what, where they are. Um, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councillor Tonby, would you like to make any comment before we um, implement some recommendations? Just to say um, thanks for the report and thanks for all the comments. And yes, underline the fact that having a stable workforce and manageable caseloads is absolutely key. And I'm sure we'd all love to grow our own more. And unfortunately, it's it's um, it would be very complicated to set up our own <laughs> degree no, programme. Chairman, it's not complicated at all. So I, I don't know why she's sat in that position saying that. It's really not complicated. You just need to get on with it. Thank you, thank you, Councillor Tambri. Did you finish what you were going to say? Yeah, I finished. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Right, some recommendations. I noted a few things that were coming out of the questions and answers people were getting. Uh, make, make a suggestion that the first one which is how we welcome the report and I just wrote notes and welcome this first work of support to the committee as an interim report being part of the improvement plan process and also welcomes the progress being made when including feedback and data from council care workers and families as part of the committee's aim to help improve openness and transparency in line with our bottom-up scrutiny approach. That seems to be something members might Agree is our overall recommendation. Any comment on that? Okay, that seems to be on then that to know. Uh, and second, I know you, you said the PDF so is training material that you referred to, isn't it? Oh, yeah, it's yeah. just um, 
Well, I know that. Can I think you pick that up? Did you want me to display books? You just know, it, it needs updating and more widely communicating and promoted. So the PDF page training material needs updating and more widely communicated and promoted. Mm -hmm. I'll share the recommendation. Yeah, yeah that would be great. Yeah, thank you. And then uh, the third one I picked up is the committee would like to see more content and activities focused on relationship building between management and staff as a key component of staff motivation and retention, and that progress on this subject should be a future on a future scrutiny agenda. Yes, indeed. Okay. So you captured as well, did you? A, a version of it, Chairman. Yes. So um, I've just taken down in brief form your first recommendation there, notes and welcome to the report, and then we'll, we'll fill in the additional detail that you provided uh, later on. Um, Secondly, um, in reference to the Herefordshire Social Work Academy and the point made by Councillor Hewitt, um, we've asked that um, the inf detailed in information contained in the academy is reviewed and brought up to date, and also that the, ca the academy should be promoted more widely and made more visible. And then uh, another point made by Councillor, Councillor Hewitt, uh, the committee agrees to revisit the challenges presented in exit interviews through a deeper inquiry, uh, possibly a task and finish group on recruitment and retention. Um, then the committee asked that in the presentation of the detail concerning the exit interviews undertaken, more information is provided where positive, where possible, of the positive or negative perceptions of the interviewee, the issues raised, and response of children's services. And I think that catches the point that uh, Councillor Jones made and Councillor Hewitt as well. I would add to that one that I would also add more quantitative as well as qualitative data. Was this meeting strictly on exit interviews? Or was there other parts, aspects of this? Meeting. That was the point Councillor Jones raised about looking for more quantitative data. I know, but we've got a whole lot of. So, uh, do you like to add something, David? No, I just. In, in, can, can we mash that down so it would be. It's all about exit interviews. Yeah, well, no, I mean, it, we're, we're saying. So, sorry, I'll do this like this. Uh, we're saying revisit. Uh, the challenges in the exit interviews by looking at recruitment and retention at a, a deeper inquiry. So we're not, it's not actually about. Could we bring that into one? Mm. It could be just one. We just need to look at, we don't need a whole. I no. see. Not quite sure. I'm to write a book on this. Well, anyway, I don't, I don't know. I don't really understand what you're saying. I don't know. I'm not quite sure I get the point, Councillor. Is it you want to be a shorter recommendation? Yeah, it's on exit interviews. So can't we bring it together and rather than expand it? What well, would you suggest the wording would be then? Well, let's give you a few yeah. minutes. Yes, yeah, you think about it. Councillor yeah. Kenny. Thank you, Chairman. I agree with Councillor Sunday. So it's um, one of those exit interviews in depth. Uh, living into it. it's, it's like well around burns, you know. It, it, it seems ridiculous to even think about doing that because let, let the officers get on with their job, okay? If we if we recruit and if we go already, we, we don't mean we won't lose so many. But to go on a, a, on a run down a rabbit hole about exit interviews, um, I, I don't think is needed at all. We should be concentrating on the children. And the workloads that the social workers have got, and the actual children that are getting abused and mistreated. And that's where we should be. Okay? Should we concentrate on the children? Um, I, I'd like to just challenge that because, um, in fact, the point of looking at recruitment and retention is the clear aim that the stability of the workforce will be increased and handover between key workers I, I and children's cases. I don't want to interrupt, let us finish. Will be... Can you let us finish first before we interrupt? So the clear aim of re recruitment and retention is to get the stability of the workforce increased so that children will have fewer key workers through their case progression and therefore develop stronger relationships. So we're concentrating on the children. That's why it is critical that we get this right and it's one of the pillars of the improvement program it's really critical and i absolutely agree with you that you know and the result of that will be to ensure that children are not 
will be one of the ways we can ensure children aren't harmed. That's why it's critical we look at that today. I'd also point out it is a council agreed motion ex-interviews were conducted and are scrutinised by this committee, so it isn't just this committee, it is a council approved motion that we do that. Yep, I understand that, Chairman. We don't have to start running down a rabbit hole with... Um, it, it, it's not difficult to look at and assess it. It's all there, okay? And whoever does them, um, and I think it should be external, with somebody, somebody who's got knowledge of it. We don't trust the officers on this. We've got a director there that can assess this and pass it down. Uh, I, you know, on this sort of thing, I absolutely can completely trust the director and that sort of things. It's when it comes to the staff he's got to shuffle around with the cases coming in, that's the difficult thing. That's where they need help. That's where they need support, not on uh, particularly exit interviews. They can look at that and they can work that out for themselves. And so I don't think we need to be hung up on it. I think that's what Councillor Summers was trying to say. Let's not get hung up on this. Um, let's concentrate on other things. Is, is that correct, David? That's correct. No, I think we that 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 we're looking for the broad feedback from the interviews, not the individual detail ones. Okay. And I think that will be the subject of future reports. We can say, now, just feedback from the interviews on the progress we're making. That's it, indeed, and hopefully we'll all be keen to see fewer uh, yeah. people leaving the service yes. in your head. Indeed. Yes. I hope that will be reflected in the nature as well. There won't be any exit. But so far, what we've put up there is way too, is over the top, to be very, very frank, and I won't vote for it. So there we go. Well, have you got a suggestion? Please, would there? you form a recommendation? Well, we just need a simple recommendation that all, anybody that's leaving employee is in, interviewed, and that interview is written down, and we have it. So we know the mistakes we may have made and what we can do better in the future. That's the, for me, that's the statement. That's what, it, that's what it's for at the end of the day. I'm not sure what Darren thinks about it, but at the end of the day, we need to know where we went wrong or where, or et cetera, et cetera. So we, we have an exit strategy that any everybody that leaves is into if they want to, because they don't have to, okay? Not in the current terms and no, conditions. No, true. so uh, to go through all this stuff uh, as, it is running down a rabbit hole. We just need a simple thing saying that job is being, and we need to know that job is being done. Whether it's done outside or in in house is is up to everybody else to decide. I think it should be done outside, but getting somebody qualified to do it is also very difficult, and it's also very expensive. And we need the money to take care of our, our kids. So you know, but at the end of the day, we need to know that, in fact, that that job is being done. Period. No, yeah, no, I, like no other reason. It is already a council motion that we do seek to get interviews and we scrutinize. Yeah, so, so it's, how do, it's how we do that. That's the point. Not that we have to do that. Councillor Jones, you were going to make a comment because you were originally raised that there can't be a question about exit interviews. Yeah, to, uh, to me, it's just simple. It just needs a number put in by there because on that last exit interview, there's 15 responses. Well, you only did about 20 exit interviews to get that. So it just might be one yeah. one of those things mentioned for each interview. So I'd want to know, if that was me, yeah. if it was 100% of those that were interviewed were reported bullying, for example, or was it just 1%? Yeah. And that would be a report that would be, yeah. be done. But it, it's yeah. just got to be simple. I, mean, yeah. I don't want loads of work. I just see tick a box. Yeah. And that person, yeah. So well, I picked up your comment to yeah. speak to that. The committee would have to see more quantity data as well. Yeah, quantity quantity data. Data. yeah. yeah. Next it's it's yeah. To me, it's simple. Okay. It's, it's not going to work. So does that satisfy you, Councillor Summers? Yeah, it's much yeah. better. Councillor Jones, that satisfy you too? Yeah. Okay, so can we adjust to that? Like, yeah. Recommendation. Yeah. Do you want me to put it back on screen? Yeah. 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 One of the problems. Sorry, Councillor. One of the issues with carers in the past is. The amount of work paperwork they have to do anyway and we need to make this we need their caring abilities not their uh, writing abilities and not their memory abilities we just need to know they care and if we're not doing the job that we should be doing then we need to know that so perhaps if we tell them that on that exit interview maybe they will change their mind but in the meantime that's basically all we need to do is know from them how they feel and that will go in a report that Darren is people can study at any time or bring to us if we ask for it. 
And that's the way I see it. Yeah, I know Councillor Ken is quite right. What we want to know is obviously the trust is to do that. We just get feedback on what they have yeah, the progress of the process and the the um the improvements that we're seeing hopefully reflected to those empty interviews. Matt, would you like to read out what we're currently now? I'm sorry, so I, I did simplify the um a recommendation yeah. off the feedback of the committee. So ask that in future the report provides a presentation of the details and issues emerging from the exit interviews and to include a greater level of quantitative data. Yeah. Oh, that. yeah. Um can I can I just say that I'd like to see the quantitative data added to the current what we've been presented today so that you know just um after the committee sometime if we could be sent round to committee members so that we have a clearer idea of how many people are saying what. That's what we need. Thank you, Daryl's nodding to say, yes, we can do that. Yeah. That's no good. Thank, Thank you. you. So I think we've got four, haven't we? And then mm -hmm. the final one was to propose that exit interviews could also be conducted by an independent interviewer to encourage greater uptake of the offer of an exit. We did say that. What more do I have to suffer before we vote on the recommendations? Did you have something else you want to No, no, I'm good. Oh, sorry, I thought you were going to speak. No, no. Okay. I said enough, I think. I think one, two, three, four, five. Do you want to take each one in turn? Yes, or please. are you happy to accept? I will send you both. We accept all those recommendations. Committee members. No, so take each in turn. I didn't accept the last one. You wanted to take them in turn. Okay, so the first one, let me note and welcome the report with the extra content that I suggested that we, Matt and I, would agree. With the wording afterwards in, uh, in the report. Yeah. Are we have to accept that? Yeah. Proposal? Yeah. Councillor Jones, seconder, Councillor Hanson, all those in favour? That's unanimous on both yeah. councillors. Thank you. Great. The second recommendation. Can you just read that, please, Matt? Uh, that asks that it, the detailed information contained in the Herefordshire Social Work Academy is reviewed and brought up to date. The Academy should be promoted more widely and made more visible. So we propose that as a recommendation. Councillor Hewitt seconded. Yeah, Councillor Jones, who seconded. Thank you. All those in favour? All in favour of that. That's the second one. Third one. Now, please. Um, that is, agrees to revisit the challenges presented in exit interviews through a deeper inquiry, possibly a task and finish group on recruitment and retention. I disagree with revisiting. Uh, if it's done properly in the first place, why would we need to revisit it? It's the future that we're looking at, not the past now. The past is only used to make the future better. Let's see what members say. Have we got a proposal for that recommendation? Yeah. Have you got a second there for that? Any other cancer? Okay, so that we don't put that one in there. Next one, please. Pat. Okay, asked that in future the report provides a presentation of the details and issues emerging from the exit interviews and to include a greater level of quantitative data. I think we all agreed on that proposal. Yeah. Uh, cancer Jones, second of Cancer Summers, all in favor. Thank you. Unanimous. Is Councillor Fagan here? She, she is. Okay, she's on there. She's on there. Yeah, no, no, she can't. Um, yeah, she's on there. Okay, um, and then the the fourth now recommendation um, proposed that exit interviews could also be conducted by an independent interviewer to encourage greater uptake of the offer of an interview. You were a proposal for that? I'm not sure about could also, as the could is iffy. Is, are we going to ask for that or are we leaving that in the air? Well, I think you're just taking the word out. Chairman, can I just come in on that? Councillor Kenya. How about offering a choice to the, the person departing? Yeah, yeah that makes more sense. It's the director or officer or, or someone else. So okay. give them a choice. A choice of either internal interview or an external interview. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Okay, that okay. makes sense. Put that in. Yeah. Okay. Somebody okay. proposed it. You're second. You're proposing that. Council seconder. Council hear it. Those in favour. Okay, so that's four in favour. Anybody against? One against. Okay. 
Oh, okay. I'll admit that. I, I do have a question. Yeah. Was the PDF based training material needs updating? Is the point council who raised? Is this that? Um, to, is that captured by the Herefordshire Social Work Academy? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, is it? Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. Can Helen yeah. advise us on that? Okay. Is that part of the, the academy, the PDF training material? Uh, I, 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 uh, welcome in the opportunity to see the, the pages that uh, Councillor Hewitt is looking at. But yes, absolutely it is. So we'll make sure that um, we'll I'll refresh those as well. Thank you. You want that included as a recommendation that Councillor yeah, yeah. Okay. That's captured in number two. Yeah. Captures a recommendation. Yes, please. I think just the PDF based training materials. Okay. And more widely communicated and promoted, I think, was your point, wasn't it, Councillor Hewitt? Sorry. That was your proposal. That was your comment. That the PDF material should be updated and more widely communicated. Yes, already. I think that's correct. Yeah. So you propose that then? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I propose it. A second for that. Cancel answer. All those in favour? So that's it. You've got five recommendations. Well, that's, that's, I think that's probably agreed in the second recommendation. <coughs> okay. The updates, the PDF yeah. documents, and okay. the okay. social so work. So I just. Amended that based on the, the commission. Yeah. So we've got yeah. four recommendations which we've approved and agreed. Thank, Thank you very much, everybody. Thank right. you. We'll move on now to the next item agenda, which is item eight children's services improvement and progress update. This is to reflect the progress <laughs> on the receipt of the non statutory improvement notice in May last year. Thank you very much. Laura Ford, your input. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. And continue areas of work for further scrutiny activity reflecting. Priority actions. I think Daryl, you're going to be giving us an update on that. Is that correct? I am, Chair. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, this is a brief and general update report. Um, the focus, in, focus and frequency of these will be determined by the committee's forward plan uh, and the focus that the committee wishes to place on elements of the improvement plan going forward. So, if you recall, you've committed to, to meeting more frequently during this municipal year. And that each uh, alternate month you'll focus on the uh, improvement plan. So, again, we'd welcome a steer from you in terms of the level of detail and what, which elements of the improvement plan. Um, you already know the details, the background to this item, so I won't take you through all of that again in terms of the improvement notice and the High Court judgment last year. Um, you're asked to note the ongoing development and introduction of a new online performance and management information framework. This is moving away from static snapshot in time reports. Uh, this is a big issue for us in terms of it's a big step forward and we welcome the opportunity to demonstrate that uh, online report in a future workshop if, if, if you'd like us to do that. Um, other elements of the report include an update on recruitment, which we've obviously discussed at some length already really in the last agenda item, uh, and workloads and capacity. Demand is increasing uh, significantly in the service and this is placing pressure on teams and on capacity. Uh, this has an impact on caseloads and on performance in some areas. Uh, the increase in demand is driven by a number of factors, including changes and improvements that we're making ourselves, uh, the impact of national events and cases that come to the national attention, uh, the impact of COVID, of course, and the emergence of legacy unmet need. So stuff that was not being addressed or met by the service in, in years gone by and that is now uh, surfacing. The pressure is particularly acute in our assessment teams where caseloads continue to be too high despite various initiatives put in place by service leaders. Additional supervisory capacity uh, to support effective case management has been added, uh, and two temporary additional teams are being recruited to divert some of the pressure in the short term whilst other adjustments are made. We're currently working on a refreshed and revised version of the plan. If you remember when it came to scrutiny last year, to Cabinet and to Council, there was agreement that it should be a live and iterative document. And so reflecting feedback from our workforce and from service users and reflecting more of the information that we know now, that we didn't know then, uh, we were refreshing that document, uh, but starting with outcomes rather than activities. So when it comes to you, you'll see a very different plan. With your permission, we'll share a working draft with you to comment on in the coming weeks and then formally bring it to the committee in the future. Happy to take questions on the paper. Thank you, so, uh, Councillor Hewitt. Okay. Um... One or two things. Um, there are three terms used in this document children in our care, child looked after, and looked after children. Which term do the children want? Um, 
uh, it would be a lot simpler if all of the children agreed on that one. So, uh, so there's a lot of studies going on around the country where people try to determine what what would what would children prefer us to be called. Um, so, in terms of that, at the point we were talking anyone about being a caring organisation and being carers, um, we as a service tend to use children in our care because that adds that you know, that, that reinforces that sense of us being corporate parents and wanting the best for those children as if they were our own family. Um, uh, children looked after children in care. Uh, are more legal terms based on different types of care order or status. Uh, the young people, funny enough, we've asked recently a group of young people and they weren't really that bothered. Um, but um, children in our care seem uh, less processed. Uh, and so uh, that, that's received more favourable. But we, yeah, we're trying to arrive at one point there. Yeah, uh, I mean, we are going to be um, having some uh, interaction with the participation officers soon. So maybe that conversation will come up then. Absolutely. I'm sorry, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah thank you. <laughs> um, and I'd like to ask, please, um, on page 83, um, there's an external peer review of the SEND provision. That's really important for our March meeting. And I'd like to know who's doing that external review, please. Uh, so it hasn't been, uh, the data hasn't been set yet, uh, but it will be the LGA that do the, uh, so they've offered to do that. We're just in the position of uh, currently negotiating that in terms of terms and suitable dates. So once we've got that, we'll confirm the dates and certainly we'll be bringing the outcome of that period. So it won't come before our March meeting? It won't come before the March meeting. No, okay. Um, yeah, I do. Um, <laughs> so um, the framework is spoken about on page 82. Um, so it's going to include, include data. This is, again, stuff which is going to um, hopefully get to our March meeting. That's the question, really. Early Health Virtual School and SEND um, is, I don't know what the framework is. It doesn't really make it clear. I don't know what the other members. So, so the framework uh, is, is, is our performance and management information framework. So we've historically relied on uh, Excel spreadsheets uh, and uh, documents that are produced on a particular date or time. So for example, you might have a scorecard, as you see in another item today, um, that was produced on a certain date. And in very brief time, it's kind of gone through its processes out of date. And so what we're moving to um, is uh, an online performance and management framework, which takes data from Mosaic and other systems. It will refresh overnight. So it's as close to real-time data as we've got, which is quite exciting for us. We've not had that before. Um, and will allow managers to interrogate that data and drill down to team level and uh, child level data. Um, it's in its infancy. So we're just moving some of those static reports onto that system. It's going to take a little while longer. We're working with uh, different parts of the service, for example, SEMD, that aren't currently part of our dashboard to make sure we reflect their activity and those measures that matter for their service. So that as the year progresses and our system evolves, we'll have a much more dynamic and more comprehensive um, uh, framework that managers can just log into and go into their own service areas and leaders like myself. Uh, and as I say, um, we'd be very happy to demonstrate um, that uh, that emerging framework uh, at, your, at your next workshop, if you like. Yeah, that's, help, that's helpful, um, Darren. Thank you, because one of the it picks up one of the questions that a member who's not here. Um, Committee member Graham Andrews raised, and he said, Why have we only got data from um, November 21? We should be having January data. And I have to say, I sort of agree, but you know, maybe, maybe the problem is in where you're still trying to collect information on the old system. I don't really know. So in this relation, it's more about when the uh, scheduling of, of, uh, of the committee was and when the papers have to be written. So often, so the, so the November data, by the time it's done its processes and gone through performance clinics and quality assurance, it's nearly uh, Christmas uh, and early January before it finishes. That is why that's the, one of the huge shortfalls or shortcomings of the system we've currently got. Um, it's always out of date. Um, so when we uh, report in future, so now we're seeing the January data, the end of month data coming through mm. in a minute. So that's part of the challenge that we've had. So it's been really hard for the service to use performance and management information to drive improvement, to know what's happening now and to be able to do something and respond to it right now, which is what this new system will allow us to do. So yeah, your, your, your frustrations reflect uh, frustrations of most of my managers, frankly, at the moment. Um, so although we do have a draft of the January data right now, but literally it's a, dra a draft. Yeah. Thank you for that. Do you have another question as well? Well, typically I do, but 
if there's any other members yes, really wanting to come in, let's let them to come in. Come back to Councillor Jones. Oh, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Um, you talk about workloads and capacity and additional teams and new um, two new project teams are introduced in November. Uh, are these actual extra staff being taken on for these or or is it people already employed given extra work to fill this role and what will happen when these are you know um, brought to a end? So these are all extra capacity. So in the uh, last nine months, the service has introduced five additional social work teams. Um, that's huge in terms of the deal. And also in the context of recruitment being really difficult, most of those are, are interims at the moment. Uh, but as I say, again, from 1st of April, we'll start recruiting those to permanent posts to try to stabilize that element. But this is all extra capacity. So this isn't asking existing social workers to do more. Uh, that would be an impossible task. Um, what it reflects absolutely is the change in demand that we've experienced over the last nine months. Some of that as a result of, of uh, changes that we've made, and some of that as a result of a range of other pressures. Uh, our proposal is that we keep every single one of those additional posts uh, throughout the whole of 2022-23, and um, so that we don't fall back into a situation where we overload our, our existing workforce. Um, what tends to happen in a local authority that has struggled um, uh, and, and has been through an event such as either an Ofsted inspection or a high court judgment as we did, um, is you start to see demands rising after a while as partner agencies start to examine their own practice, uh, perhaps an element of being risk averse, but also you see refer as confidence grows in the system and in the leadership of the system, you see more referrals coming in because people know you're going to respond to them. So uh, that extra capacity is absolutely needed. We've got no plans to take it away uh, and we will work with um, with the council to think about what that future structure needs to look like, particularly in 23, 24 and 25. So we need to make sure that ultimately we get to a sustainable model of, of a workforce that is, uh, has the capacity to manage with our demand going forward, which we haven't had in the past. And that's been part of the struggle this year. Okay, how yeah. many yeah. 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 Thank you, Chair. Um, Darren, one of the issues you've had in the past is that uh, Frontline workers are not legal people. They don't know the rules and laws. They may know some of them. I know I understand that we have more legal on staff. Or is, is the link to them fairly accessible? Thank you. Uh, it absolutely is. And uh, some of our colleagues, whilst they're not uh, lawyers, they spend a lot of time in court. Uh, so so uh, we've got some, some uh, colleagues and managers who are very, very experienced. Uh, in the court arena and we've got some really positive feedback about them from the courts recently but we have got an expanded uh, legal team uh, on the back of the high court judgment particularly last year uh, we have really good and close relationships between um, our, our legal team uh, lawyers barristers uh, and our senior managers and social workers so that happens uh, at the decision making point when you consider whether whether we need to go into court uh, and at each stage in the process where we go into the court uh, and, and you might like to know that in the th of the last 36 instances where we've gone into court, uh, in 34 of those 36 cases, we've got the court order that we sought, uh, which again is a huge, and also within a, 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 an acceptable time scale for the courts and for the family. So uh, there's, there's much improvement there. And again, you might want to ask us for more of a focused look at that court work and that relationship with legal services. Uh, yeah, you know, that was, yeah, I'm happy to hear what you're saying. I just, there still seems to be a bit of onus put on the frontline worker. You said they know, some of them know more and they spend a lot of time in court. I need to know that they are comfortable, that they're, they're, they do know, and they've been told that there is help there if they need it. And there is support, I'm not saying help, because help might be an insult to them, but there is support. And I think we need to promote that as support. So they, they don't go in saying, this is all dependent on me, I, I've got to fall back. And and and, uh, and there is always a solicitor in court with our social workers and our team managers. So it's <laughs> no, I'm not with the court case. I'm concerned about when they're visiting, and they know they have to make a decision or some kind of a decision. They can quickly go back to legal and say this, this, and this. What do I do? I don't. So, no, this is to be very good getting to court. Yeah. So that, okay, yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely, and and. Um, most of that's directed through their line manager and supervisor because obviously we instruct legal, but the, the legal advice is available throughout the whole of the process. And, and again, we'd happily bring back some information and perhaps, perhaps also a colleague from our legal team to talk to you in the future. Please. Yeah, you. Thank you very much.
I notice if you heard that about that 34 quarter of that 36 went in. What we request is is that an increase over recent months and years? It'd be good to know if that is the case and we're making better progress on. Um, again, we don't set targets or, or goals because that's because this is about families' lives that we're dealing with. I think the, the I think the positive take on this is that we're getting that threshold right, and that threshold, uh, it, you know, the, the judges and the courts agree with the reason and the rationale while we go into the courts. Yeah, you know, what we would like to see is more families staying together and us not going into courts. Yeah, absolutely, more. but I think, but that's fact. It, but it's feedback based. When you consider the feedback from the High Court judgment last year, um, some of that decision making and that rationale was clearly wrong. Uh, the feedback we're getting at the moment is we're getting that much better, but obviously we want to support families to stay together where we can and have fewer cases go to court. And that is a, a different measurable rate of progress. That's why we need the yeah. frontline workers to have that comfort zone. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kenyon, I think you have your hand up. Thank you, Chairman. I've spoken a few times. Well, I've been in court a few times as well. Can you use any voice? Looking into this, um, we've ended up where we are with, with children's services. It's awful. But this now is a golden opportunity to sort it out. And as director, you should be rubbing your hands thinking, right, this is what we need to do to get there. And I'm sure you are, okay? Like every confidence in you, okay? You're looking me in the eye, which is always good. Um, we've got additional funds from DfE, which is great. Um, is there anyone chasing any more additional funds? Are we still chasing that? Now, that's my first question. Well, that's a question, I guess. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so uh, we, we were very fortunate to, to receive a grant from the Department for Education for £1.7 million to speed up some of the improvements. Um, and uh, the condition of that is it will have to be spent with the outcomes achieved by the 31st of March. We're well on track for that, and that's very closely, uh, robustly monitored. The DfE, I had the conversation with you yesterday about whether there's more money in the pipeline, potentially. Uh, they don't yet know, so they, they haven't yet got their... Um, devolved budgets out of the out of the settlement at the end of last year. They don't know what's going to be in the pot this year, uh, but we do know that there will be potentially more money available for sector led improvement partner work right. that, we, that we can chuckled. access. I yeah. almost chuckled when you said it had to be spent by the 31st of April. Nothing else. Social services can definitely spend money. Um, I've got another couple of questions. Um, I don't know if it's related to this, but perhaps you can help me out. Um, you mentioned about workloads and, and social workers and the like. Um, coming into the system, we know there's three different types of children that go into the system and know where they're placed. How many children are waiting to be stated in um, or uh, so stated in or waiting for a social worker? What's the wait time to be, be in front of us over work? Uh, right here, the question, can you just be a bit right, more so about this? Yeah. Basically, basically, what's the wait time for, for a child or, or a family uh, for a social worker to actually get in there? There's an issue. Um, what's the wait time to be seen by a social worker to be seen or indeed um, stated at school and if that's picked up if social workers need to be involved in schools you know is that moving along because a lot of these things are picked up in schools um, you don't necessarily knock on every door but you can see a child in a school and see there's an issue potentially you, you can go back the other way so in relation to a statement, I'm guessing you mean a statement of educational needs uh, for some children. So I don't have the answer to that on the top of my head, but I'll, I'll send provide a written answer for that uh, and get you the detail. I was just not in the uh, data pack that I brought with me. Um, but I do know that in terms of, uh, in terms of general um, performance, uh, we're one of the better performing local authorities in the region around education, health and care plans and statements. But I'll get you the actual data so we can have that conversation. But in terms of children being visited, you know, that's a different thing. So the vast majority of children, so when children come in through the MASH, and need an assessment by a social worker. Um, most of those are visited within five working days of that referral when they enter the assessment teams. Um, and obviously then we undertake a child and family assessment, which can take um, you know, either a matter of days or potentially several weeks, depending on the complexity of the needs identified. Okay, fantastic. And uh, that reassures me a lot. My final question, um, mental health, young people, mental health, and uh, clinical mental health, and um, if they find themselves in that situation, is there, going from clinical hospital side of things into, is there a social worker hookup automatically with hospitals and the other people? Uh, so there's a, there's a number of hookups, uh, if you like. So if a young person uh, was admitted uh, uh, to a hospital, then that's an automatic referral. Um, where a young person has um, 
more than low level um, health and well-being concerns and that should be a referral from either the school or from health services uh, and there's a lot of data sharing uh, and collaboration that goes on to make sure that we catch many more of those uh, obviously um, there's a, been a, a, a um, something we talked about the council some in the past there's a lot lot more work been going on in schools over the last year because of the impact of covid on on, uh, on well-being and mental health for children and people so there's many more services and pathways that have developed over the past year what we need, one of the areas where I'm uh, more focused at the minute is making sure we've got those acute powers. Oh, so you didn't come to you, oh, I'm sorry. One of, one of the areas, so there's uh, many more pathways available from um, in schools because of the, the way we've had to work over the last two years. Uh, there's lots of hookups in terms of, uh, there are several points in engagement with different services where services should be making referrals to us, including schools and health services. And one of the areas where we've particularly focused on the minute with our public health colleagues is making sure we've got the acute pathways right for those young people who are um, uh, diagnosed uh, with mental ill health or acutely unwell to making sure that we're able to access those services as speedily as we can. And the question, Jim, and actually I should point out that so if you look at the screen, the whole of our next meeting is on mental health and young people. Uh, Councillor Summers. Um, I don't like to t speak ill of people who have gone before you, Daryl, but schools for the last five years, in my experience, have always been some of the we should stay away from, and it's all under, under take, taken care of, and I've always argued that point. Uh, and this goes back to 2015, to be frank. Uh, so that's in the past, but um, um, it sounds to me like you're having more input in schools and you're sharing that information, which I hope you are. So thank you. Uh yeah, we've, you know, I'm, we've got a very good uh, service director for education in Kerry Morgan. He's got a good relationship with schools. Uh, I recently met with a group of uh, primary head teachers, uh, and um, and whilst we've always we still got more work to do, that's why we're on an improvement journey. Um, but actually, we got some really good feedback about the changes that we've made at the Mash and how we respond to referrals. So I'm, I'm pleased that's a relationship that's uh, developing and more positive than perhaps it was in your experience. And please keep us updated because I that's one one thing I do focus on fairly regularly, and we'll be hearing from you from time to time. Thank you. I look forward to it. Thank you. Both. Before we come to Councillor Hewitt's further question, uh, Councillor Hanson, did you want to add anything at all? Yes, please. Um, in can I go back to um, fourteen and fifteen? Um, both talk about later in February. Um, and have I missed? Have I missed? I might have missed something, but um, we, I think we sort of are later in February now um, for the advertising for the service director posts and the recruitment cam campaign. Um, so are they out yet? And also with the recruitment campaign, um, are the, ha has advertising happened in the churches and the faith communities? Uh, so, um, so the, the so um, there is a slight delay on those. So they haven't yet been advertised. They'll be advertised uh, uh, either the end of the first week in March or the beginning of the second week in March, simply because of the way we've we've gone about procuring the agency that's involved in that uh, and making sure we finish the community care contract off in terms of getting all lined up. Um, but those posts uh, uh, will be advertised and again open to any suitably qualified and experienced internal candidates. Um, what we, uh, in terms of our recruitment campaign, will use online media and social media pri primar primarily, um, uh, and obviously the, the council uh, Facebook page and Twitter page is well connected with local communities, faith groups and, and voluntary groups. So we don't intend, uh, we're not planning to do a targeted campaign specifically, but we intend to use our existing platforms as well as we can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh... Councillor Pagan, I don't know if you want to add anything before we ask Councillor for the rest of our questions. Are you suggesting could take another round? No, no, thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, just make sure we're included even though you're in you that. For that, Councillor Pagan, you have another question? Thank you, I'll try and read the <laughs> So basically, um, I, what I'd like to see and this is as a result of um, a challenging conversation we had with Daryl just before the meeting. I would like to see before the committee some of the eloquence about the management philosophy reflected in our improvement promotions. Because 
I think it's really important that anybody thinking of um, applying for a job with the directorate know what the philosophy of management is and how they will be dealt with. And you spoke about restorative. I spoke about um, what, um, what is systemic practice. There are different models of how management is dealt with, but the key thing that I wanted to see in the report, and you agreed it wasn't reflected that strongly, was how we manage relationships in our social work teams. So I'd like to see some evidence of that come back to the commission, please. Thank you. Brief enough? <laughs> Any other questions? I, I know exactly what you said, Daryl, that as part of um, us managing the group, how we've doubled the number of meetings up to the end of this council year, uh, alternative ones being improvement of our focus, and others mainstream focus. And we've also had a number of workshops, of course, particularly on subjects that are coming up before meetings. Not only so we can get in depth feedback on them, but as a training experience as well. And the task and finish group option is something we want to explore as well. So that's been, uh, I think, good progress. Councillor Summers, if you ask Councillor Townsville, she's got comments. Do you I just want to one more question? It, actually, it's a question, uh, or uh, uh, I'd like to know if we can get a copy of the contract that care givers have to sign when, they, when we take them on. The contract of employment. Yeah, uh, I'm sure. I, I'm sure HR can. We can. I'm sure we can get you a copy of the of, of the basic template for that. Certainly, yes. So I'd like to get a copy of it. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, uh, Councillor Tongue. I saw that you put a note up to say you like the term "children in our care." I, I like that too. Did you want to add any other comments to the improvement plan before we go into recommendation? Just to you know, thank the committee for your comments and your very good questions. Um, I'm pleased that we've got a renewed plan. Um, I'm pleased that we've got teams in who are helping us clear the decks and you know address the backlogs. That's really, really important. I'm pleased that we're taking advantage of uh, what the LGA is offering because there's a lot of really good support out there. And, um, and yeah, I agree with what's been said about the importance of social workers being, who appear in court, being given the training and support that they need. And as I put in the chat, you know, we did discuss this last year in May in the committee, so people might be interested to have another look at that. And I agree with Councillor Hewitt that relationships are absolutely key to everything, whether it's the council's relationship with schools or our relationship with families or managers' relationships with their teams. So um, I think that's something we can really... Um, try and do in a really special way here in Herefordshire. Yeah. Yes, Tika, picking up on your point about LGA support, uh, on Thursday we have the second of the two hour LGA training workshops to the committee based upon the assessment we produced a few months ago, so making progress there. And um, they also have found a mentor, myself and Jenny as chair and vice chair. A, a gentleman called James Kempson, who was going to come today, but unfortunately, because of all the traffic confusion last night, he wasn't able to make it. But he was going to come and listen in and see people like yourself and the leader, David Hitchener, and Paul Walker, and Daryl to get feedback on how you think scrutiny is being run and how it could be approved. So, we're making significant progress in the LGA helping us to improve the effectiveness of scrutiny as well to pick up on, on the points you raised. So thank you very much for that input. My right, recommendations, Matt, did you catch them? I'm sure you did. Um, share them on screen. So uh, what I picked up are um, the committee requests an overview of the emerging framework for performance and management at a, at a forthcoming workshop. Um, allocates a report on the outcomes of the external peer review of SEND provision to a forthcoming meeting as soon as available. Uh, allocates a report to a forthcoming meeting to provide detail of the access of social workers to legal advice and support when undertaking casework. That's Councillor Summers' point. Um, and asks that in future the report reflects how relationships are positively managed with staff in line with management philosophies. Anybody got anything to add to that? So I think one includes that future scrutiny should be looking at the amended 
improvement plan to include activity as well as the five pillars? Because that's the major change, isn't it, Daryl? Plans amended, because at the moment there are five pillars of the framework, but it's going to be amended with specific activities as part of the framework. That's quite just yeah, so it's going to be... Uh... It's going to be revised and refreshed because having the five programs at the minute actually work against each other at times. It's, it's better to see uh, partnerships embedded all, throughout all of them rather than as a standalone. So I think we've learned a lot from the, the first few months of the current plan um, and where the first plan was focused on activities and transactions and just saying whether they've been done or not. This one starts with a principle about what needs to improve and what are the outcomes we want to see. So it'll be a lot easier to report back to yourselves for scrutiny, but also to the improvement board and others and demonstrate then that we're improving outcomes for children and young people rather than just doing lots of activity. Yes. Specific targets can to I, scrutinize can I against. The last one, can, can I ask, um, there was some nodding, so I think there's some agreement about this, that, the, that when we talk about the management philosophies, those are more widely advertised as ideal selling points. You know, so it forms part of the recruitment strategy in some way. Yes. Thank you. So, is the first one covering what we talked about the amended improvement plan, where we can actually scrutinize against specific activities and progress, not generally just the framework? We already have the framework, it's going to be amended to include specific activities so we can scrutinize against those. Okay. Does that capture it, or do you want to? Question overview of the amended improvement plan. The, the framework already exists, okay. so it's uh, the amended improvement plan to include activities under the framework, really, that's what we're talking about, isn't it? And I think, right. two, I think uh, you're right, there's two separate activities there. So uh, one, one is, I, I think you're asking to see, or, uh, receive an overview of the amended improvement plan, perhaps as a workshop, see how we're developing that. Yeah. And then you had also asked that we also demonstrate that emerging uh, Power BI online uh, performance framework. Uh, two slightly different things, but we could do them in the same uh, workshop, so. Yeah, great. Yeah, there's something about the Okay, so would you like to read this one at the time then, please? Right, okay, so uh, as, as now amended, uh, the committee requests an overview of the amended improvement plan at a forthcoming workshop to also uh, focus on the framework for performance and management, um, allocates a report on the outcomes of the external peer review of uh, SEND provision to a forthcoming meeting as soon as available, allocates a report to a forthcoming meeting to provide detail of the access of social workers to legal advice and support when undertaking casework, and asks that in future the report reflects how relationships are positively managed with staff in line with management philosophies which are more widely advertised as a unique selling point in recruitment strategies. I'd like to have in the first one where you say on the framework, on the framework activities. Because the framework is the framework, but it doesn't actually include specific activities, which is what the major changes can be. Okay, thank you for that. Do we want to make a recommendation that we adopt the term children in our care? I think this is a term that we use, Daryl, and I know. You said you quite liked it. Um, is that something we should formally consider saying? No, I think we've got a different legislation. I don't think we should be getting ourselves too into, into that okay. one. I think I think the corporate parenting board, which Councillor uh, Anson's on, and, and others, I think they, they'll help us to develop our language and our our framework around corporate parenting support. But I think we probably need to not get too stuck on that one. If I'm just asking the right. question. It's yeah. Okay, if you want to take them one at a time again. Members? Or all of them? It's only proposed to take them all as well, then. Yeah. Proposal? Proposal? Councillor Jones, seconder. Councillor Summers, all those in favour? Unanimous. Thank you very much. Does anybody want a 10 minute comfort break before we go on to item nine? Yes or no? Yes, yes, yes. I think so, yeah. Okay, can we confirm that the recording has been stopped, please?
So I'll say a paragraph of the paper and then introduce Don if that's what I'm doing. Are we lost anybody? Just notice that now we're standing, I shouldn't talk so much. Let's get the weights. Thank you. We we'll move on to item nine in the agenda, which is fostering service update. This is to review the performance of the fostering service outlined in the annual report, which is attached to Appendix A of the agenda minutes. And we we'll welcome Ruth Mathimbo, um, I hope I got that right, and Diana Maria, the service manager for fostering and permanent services, introducing this item. Sorry to keep you late, waiting late, but can you? Um, are you going to introduce it first? Time? I'll just say, well, if I may, Chair. Yeah. Um, so some members of the committee uh, participated in a workshop earlier this year that involved members of the fostering team uh, and foster carers, and this provided a background to this paper. Um, the report comes to the committee far later in the year than any of us will ordinarily expect, uh, as indeed did the annual report for the independent review in Oxford recently. This was a consequence of, of the impact of the High Court judgment last year and changes to the service. Um, subject to the decisions about your forward work plan, service is planning to present the report for the period 31st of March this year in the summer, so you see it in a much more timely way. Um, the paper briefly outlines key achievements in 2020 to 21, as, prior, as well as priorities for what is the current year. I'll hand over to Dana Marritt, uh, the service manager for fostering and permanent service, and to Ruth Madembo, head of service for corporate parenting, to briefly draw out the key themes and then respond to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Daryl. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dana Marrett. I'm the Interim Service Manager for Fostering, um, and I've been in post since July of 2021. I'm going to give just a short, short presentation, as Daryl mentioned, which provides a summary of the Fostering Annual, annual Report for April 2020 to March 2021, uh, which I know you will have received and hopefully have the opportunity to have a read of. Um, I'll take any questions at the end, if that's OK. Um, so just starting with a beautiful landscape picture of um, Herefordshire there. Um, this um, first slide is an extract from the current fostering service, cost fostering service statement of purpose, which I wrote recently. Um, the focus really is on keeping children and people firmly at the centre of our practice and um, best interest decision making in order to meet their individual needs and improve their outcomes. So really uh, the key um, approaches and principles that we use are valuing difference and diversity, respecting children's rights, working in partnership with children and carers and others, uh, tracking the experience and um, progress of children um, in order to make sure that we are uh, meeting those outcomes and uh, recruitment and training and support of foster carers to assure that we provide a high standard of care, that we have a good matching process and that we look at safety and security and make sure all our children are safe in those placements. Um, we aim to be aspirational and ambitious for children and support them in reaching their own goals and dreams. Uh, as a service manager, I initially had responsibility for two teams in the fostering service. Uh, first of all, the assessment team uh, who assess prospective carers and the supervision and support team who regularly visit and see children and provide ongoing support and advice to carers. So um, this is the first team, the recruitment and assessment team uh, who do the assessments. Uh, and those, as well as general foster carers, include assessments for uh, connected carers, temporary approved carers, respite carers, overnight short breaks carers and supported lodgings carers. So there's quite a breadth of carers. We tend to use foster carers in a generic way to describe all of them. Um, no, so no, we I also... Do... Interrupt, no, I've got to interrupt a second. Could you put it on full screen, please? We can only see part of it. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh gosh, well, maybe I should have taken down a look on his offer to, um, let me see if I can do that. <laughs> should be on the bottom, I think, just as I made it smaller. Okay, made it smaller, yes. <laughs> oh, let me see what I can do. Hold on. It's a challenge your OT, but it'll be a bit easier to read it. Give it a little right. Is that any better? What about that? Yeah, that's better. Yeah, very good. It's like the eye test. Yes. Is that okay? 
I think I need a nice test to talk of those. My apologies for that. Thank you for bringing it to my attention. Uh, so, yes, I initially had two teams, and we also do the um, assessments for special guardianship carers. Uh, we do promote special guardianship as an early permanent option, but obviously we have to give carers the choice of, um, you know, when they're ready to take on that responsibility. But we do the assessments in that team as well. Okay, now I'm going to struggle to go to the next slide. Okay, um, the support and supervision team was the second team. Um, they do the um, supervision and support for um, our foster carers. Uh, so we do regular visits and ongoing support and advice for them. And we make sure that we see children during those visits. Uh, we have in recent months moved from three monthly visits to six weekly visits, which is an improvement. Um, and although we're only required to do one unannounced visit per annum in the statutory guidance, we do actually do two visits per annum uh, to make sure that we're um, keeping on top of all the things that I mentioned in terms of making sure that we provide the right kinds of placements. Okay, um, we now have a third team which has been set up since I came into post. Um, this third team is our permanence team and um, they're responsible for ensuring that the assessed needs of our children in foster care are met and their outcomes are improved through providing regular supervision and advice and support to carers. So during the period April 2020 to March 2021, um, supervisory visits were required to take place every three months, as I mentioned, but it's now been increased to six weekly. And I uh, have put some parameters around um, visits to children to ensure that they are seen at least once a quarter. Uh, that's a, a, a minimum standard, not a maximum. <laughs> um, so um, all of our annual reviews are up to date and completed at this time. And uh, we do have a fostering IRO now who does all of those reviews for us, which um, makes a real difference. I set up recently a regular meeting with our team managers and the FIRO so that we can pick up any individual issues that CARES is bringing up and also that we can um, look at any themes and issues that are developing as well. Okay. Um, in terms of recruitment and... Um, Foster care of foster carers. Um, this is from April uh, 2020 to March 2021, the timeframe of the report. So you can see there that we had 269 inquiries, uh, 93 initial visits, um, 11 of which were cancelled, which took us down from 104, and then the number of applications, and then the number of people who moved to full ADM um, approval. Uh, but of the 35 applications at that at the end of that period, not everyone had yet been to foster panel. Um, at the moment, in terms of our figures, it's looking um, pretty similar. Uh, we've got 260 initial, 68 inquir initial inquiries, 94 uh, initial visits, and the same number of um, um, applications and uh, 14 approvals, so just a slight increase. But our current target for um, approvals is 15 uh, new foster carers for a year. So, so for both years, it's very close to the target. Uh, we are looking at increasing the target from April of this year to 25, which is gonna mean that we'll need significantly more resource to do that. So more foster panel members, more foster panels so we'd have to go up from the two that we do every month at the moment uh, we will need uh, more uh, people to be able to do our assessments in order to achieve that target okay um for some reason it's not going down okay this is just the makeup of the uh, foster panel um uh, you can see um that we have um, well, you can't see, but what I can tell you is that we've got a good, solid membership who are very committed, but they're quite a small group 
um, and uh, they're not a very diverse group. So we're doing some work around um, extending the diversity in the panel and also the number of panel members. So we're just about to put out a rolling advert for that. Uh, the other um, thing that we need to think about in terms of panel member representation is getting some of our elected members on the panel um, to um, uh, within their role as corporate parent, um, which is really good practice. And I have um, um, managed to achieve in other authorities that I've been in, so we will look at that further. Um, I have put a quality assurance um, framework in place. Uh, it's the early part of it but it means that I do quarterly observations and report in terms of improvement. And then monthly business meetings are set up to look at that and various other things that come up as issues that we need to make decisions on. Uh, and we also make sure now that we give uh, anybody who's attending feedback using uh, some document templates that we've put together. Okay. So um, in terms of the... Oh... I don't understand what's happening. Oh, there we go. So here we've got some um, figures that relate to foster panel activity. Um, you can see that foster panel is very busy in terms of how much they do in any given year. Um, the number of um, um, activity that we've done this year compared to that last year is slightly more. Uh, so it is already increasing even without us, um, you know, doing the additional work to take us up to 25. Um, number of foster carers we had in uh, at the end of March 2021 was 370. Um, at the moment, we've got three, 276 uh, carers uh, and less households but at that time we had uh, 210 households in total with um, 160 of those being households with two carers and 50 being households with single carers. Um, you can see the breakdown in terms of ethnicity, the vast majority of households are white British uh, with less than 1% really um, in any other um, category. Uh, in the the year to date, um, it's very similar. Uh, there are only 3% that are not uh, white British and meet one of the other categories. So this is just an outline of the um, training that we provide for our foster carers. Um, the uh, level one is the pre-approval that we do for prospective carers, which is called Skills to Foster Training. Um, and everyone has to attend that before they can be uh, passed into the process of approval. approval. Um, at the moment, I am doing, with a, a group of dedicated uh, people, we are doing a review of the skills to foster training to make sure that it's uh, more interactive, a bit more interesting, and um, uh, kind of more creative in its approach. The level two training is uh, post-approval mandatory training. Again, we're looking at um, reviewing this and updating it. Uh, but at the moment, it includes safeguarding, uh, first aid and diversity training. Oh, gosh, it's doing it again. There we go. <laughs> Level three okay. is any additional training. Um, all of our carers are asked to do uh, three or four additional training courses. And then any specialist training, any bespoke training um, that will help that particular carer to meet the needs of any children they have placed with them. Uh, so um, from the time I came into post today, these are some of the things that in, in conjunction with a very strong team of team managers and a, a really dedicated group of staff, we managed to put in place. So we have now got a... Uh, foster panel advisor and a part-time marketing officer. We have uh, managed to recruit a, a care leaver for the foster panel, uh, which was my first effort to increase the diversity. And I did um, interview her myself and it was a great pleasure and it's, it's good to have her on the panel. Uh, we've commenced our improvement planning journey. In fact, I've just had a session before I came here with our 
team, whole team, about um, redefining our and, and resetting our culture. Uh, but we do that through some uh, monthly team meetings with the leadership team and with the rest of the team. And we're working together on, on doing that. We do have an independent reviewing officer, as I mentioned earlier, who does all of our annual reviews. Also, as mentioned earlier, we've got the permanence team set up. Our foster care register is completed now, and we have uh, been looking at workload management. So in the support team, we have reached a, a capacity, a threshold of 15 in terms of capacity, but we've got some work to do about around getting that right in the assessment team, which is more challenging because they hold a varied caseload. And we've also introduced reflective group supervision. So there's my summary for you. Thank you, Joanna. Any council got questions? You already have your hand up, so I'm not doing the presentation. I'm just going to try and take this down. I'll make it quick, quick, Dana. Um, I appreciate you only being in the post in June. Um, what we've just heard is basically a year old um, with a few adjustments. I would have preferred to see more of the adjustments and know what's happening on the ground right now. So I'm not going to say too much. Uh, I'll leave it up to everybody else, but I think uh, I'll be a little bit harder on you the next time we do this. Thank you. Okay, you're most welcome. Councillor Hewitt. Thank you. Oh my goodness, how pleased was I to see the introduction of reflective group supervision. Fantastic. Uh, thank really, you. really good. Um, a couple of questions. Uh, you mentioned quality assurance. I want to know whether that's <coughs> Um, a new initiative? Uh, the framework, the quality assurance framework for foster panel, which I was referring to, is a brand new framework that I've introduced. That doesn't mean, though, that we haven't got our eye firmly on quality assurance in a more general sense. So we do make sure, for example, that our assessments, we quality assure them, uh, and all of our, all the other elements of our work, we, we quality assure as well. It's just that I mentioned that because it is a new initiative for Foster Panel. Okay, another question. Um, yes. The first, sorry, had you finished? With? Yes, I have, thank you. Yeah, sorry. Um, the, okay. I met the selection onto the uh, independent Foster Panel, I'm not clear yeah. how people um, arrive at being there. And I, I'd like to know how long people are on the panel before they have to, you know, like us lot, be re-elected. <laughs> yes, I understand. It's not, it's not a role that people are elected to in the way that you are. Um, quite often local authorities uh, find people by word of mouth and then do interviews. So um, what, what I've asked uh, our panel advisors to do is to put out a rolling advert for us uh, so it will go out with the usual job adverts for Herefordshire, but stating that we are looking for uh, to diversify our panel membership and ask people to um, submit a, an expression of interest. Then we will do interviews and, and that's how we recruit. Um, the panel advisor is also writing um, drafting uh, with my support, a foster panel handbook. So at the moment, we don't have um, um, a specific time uh, to which uh, panel members remain on panel. However, we will do when we've finished the handbook. Usually in other authorities I've worked in, it's been somewhere between three to five years. Yeah. Are, you, are you using models from other, well, obviously from your previous work experience to help you? Yes, yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've worked in probably 13 of the local authorities and there oh, are lots besides those. So we, 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 yeah, we use best practice to inform what we do. Thank you very much. And I've got, uh, I don't know this question. So um, page 103, it says, uh, recommendations for deregistration. What's that about? Ah, well, um, foster carers can be deregistered. It's a bit of a strong word. Sometimes they withdraw, for example, they retire or they leave the country 
or they decide it's not for them anymore or some something else changes in their family. Less occasionally, just twice, I think, if I remember correctly, in the previous period that this report talks about, there were two where it was the local authority who decided to deregister. Um, and that is most often going to be related to uh, any safeguarding concerns that we have in relation to the care that has been provided by those carers. Okay. Okay. And last question. Um, you know, I was interested the other day to see the use of the solar health model, model, but having been a teacher, I'm very aware that, you know, presenting carers of what, or, you know, pupils, so to speak, with, um, you know, a, a presentation doesn't necessarily change behaviour. The only way of changing behaviour is by support. So I'm pleased to hear that you want to make the training more interactive. But I'm also yeah. a little bit dismayed at this sort of promotion of the solitary model because, you know, it can't be a tick box exercise training and support for our carers. It's really... Yes. Um... To be honest, councillor, quite a lot has changed since that report was written, which really ties into what the first councillor was saying about getting an update. It's not actually going to be that far off before you see the next report. But okay. actually what we're looking at at the moment is um, a trauma-informed approach to um, practice, both for foster carers and for staff, and then widening that, widening that out to other professionals that we work with um, so we won't be focusing so much on the solid whole model. That's fantastic news. Thank you so much. Thanks, Rose. And just, on, okay. just a quick follow-on on the numbers of the committee. Uh, sorry, the, 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 the interview committee. There's 14 you've got. Is that the um, the number that you officially look for? Or is, is it full complement? I'm really sorry. I didn't catch the beginning of number your of question. The number of committee, the fostering it. Uh, section committee, there are 14 names I saw you put there. Is that a full complement? I mean, do you have difficulty getting people for the committee, or, or is that a full complement of the? the oh, for, 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 for foster panel, do you mean? Yeah, the foster panel. So do is not. Yes, one. yes. That that's everybody on there, including Ruth Madembo, who's here, who's our agency decision maker, and they're all the members. Um, what I was mentioning earlier is that we are going to need to recruit more people. Uh, to that panel um, to one just increase the numbers but two to increase the diversity of the panel and because our target for recruitment of in-house foster carers is shifting from 15 to 25 that will be, become more pertinent and um, we will probably have to look at having more than one panel which will require more members so uh, what we're doing at the moment is putting out a rolling advert for people to put in an expression of interest to become a panel member. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Tamara, I know you, uh, sorry, Fagan, I know you wanted to ask a question, but Daryl wants to come back on that particular point that we just asked, and um, why are you doing so, Daryl? It would be good to know more about 15 to 25 is a significant increase, a little bit more why um, it's such a significant increase needed it would be, I think, useful to know. So I'll come back to you, Tony, but Daryl, can you give your response, please, to you okay, I'll just on, on the membership of the panel and, and thanks, Diana, for your presentation. Um, I think we, in terms of best practice, um, you would typically see elected members on a fostering panel. Uh, we haven't had, I think Diana can correct me, but I don't think we've seen an elected member on our fostering panel for, yeah. for some years. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and we would welcome, you know, perhaps a scrutiny's role to champion that to try to recruit uh, members. Uh, from full council who might be as part of our rota, part of that group, a member of fostering panel. I think it's a it's a very worthy activity uh, and, and brings real quality to a fostering panel. So that would be best practice. And we don't have any members on our fostering panel at the moment. Uh, answering the question about uh, why 25 from 15, uh, 15, uh, yeah, a, a fostering service has to run to, to stand still by and large because some foster carers retire, uh, some their, their family and life circumstances change and they can no longer provide uh, foster care, uh, others become special guardians and then that's a really good outcome for a child in terms of permanence because we lost, we lose a fostering placement at the same time. Um, what we want to see in terms of best practice and good outcomes for children and young people is much more sufficiency, more choice for children who come into our care so that we have more 
choice and availability of family type of placements for them rather than resorting to, to uh, residential placements and the like. Um, so the, the increase that uh, Dan is talking about is a net increase, recognising that some people retire and move mm -hmm. on. Um, what we want to do is offer more children in our care a family type placement and the limit and, and so we set ourselves an ambitious target to recruit more foster carers i think you know it's, uh, foster carers do an amazing job um, and many people think about becoming foster carers and if anybody's watching this broadcast and is thinking about it getting, <laughs> with Donna, getting in touch with Donna or myself um yeah we, we would welcome please more do foster carers. yeah we can never have too many foster carers that sounds yeah. like a real positive improvement of more into yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and if you don't mind me add, just add into that daryl if it's okay i think what we also want to do is to reduce our reliance on um in, using yeah. independent fostering agencies uh, one there is a cost related to that but two it often means that children are placed outside of our uh, of our local authority area which we uh, we wish to reduce as well Okay, thank you. I know Tony and Ruth, you both had your hands up. I can't remember who's first, but Tony, I think you were probably first. You had but a question at that time. If, if I ask my questions, then Ruth will probably answer them anyway. The, okay. um, uh, it, and, and actually, one of the questions was about the independent agencies. I was wondering, you know, are any of those based in Herefordshire and do the, do the children who are placed through these independent agencies, um, do they stay within Herefordshire? Which I suspect the, the answer is, is, is no from what I heard Diana say, but Ru Ruth might respond. And, and just the other question was sort of what, you, you know, there's sort of a, a high number of people who are b express an interest in fostering. And then once that's whittled down, uh, it's, it's sort of considerably less that actually actually go ahead. So I was wondering if we've got any idea of what the reasons are that uh, sort of people you know the interest wanes sort of wanes off as as they get further down the process and if there's anything that we can do to actually um sort of address that i'll i'll defer to ruth or dana uh, to, to answer that if, if they've got the, that, that detail to hand yeah um ruth Okay, you go first, Dada, because I, okay. and then I'll answer because I, I've got a number of points I wanted to make from before. Okay, um, in relation to um, uh, independent fostering agencies within Herefordshire, we don't have those. So for the most part, when we're using independent agencies, we're placing outside of the uh, local authority area. Um, in relation to the number of inquiries that do start quite high, as you mentioned, um, about half of, uh, about, a big percentage of those are Facebook inquiries. And what we found is that regionally, those are the ones that drop off the most. We usually lose about half of them. And we think that's because um, people who make an initial inquiry through Facebook have probably just seen it in passing and are not as interested uh, in the rest of the process as other people who are seeking it out. Um, one of the things that we've, uh, well, a couple of things we've got in place now is we've got a, a good marketing and recruitment strategy in place. We've got that part-time marketing officer that I mentioned. And we're also doing some work at the moment, looking at commissioning uh, a digital, digital marketing um, um, expert input that will help us to target better in terms of getting inquiries and the conversion from the number of inquiries to the number of approvals increasing. Thank you for that, Ruth. You had your hand up. Did you want to make an additional point? Yes, thank you. I just wanted to comment. There was earlier on, I think there was a question about uh, training, just to add on to what Dana was saying in terms of uh, trauma informed training, and that we also use, we also have the support of our care leavers. They also um, support us in terms of training for foster carers, which is quite uh, helpful um, and uh, meaningful for those uh, foster carers. Oh, uh, and also in terms of increasing our numbers for, I think uh, Daryl and Dana also mentioned, in terms of uh, increasing our numbers for foster carers, we are ambitious in terms of improving, increasing it to 25. 
one of the reasons that we find relying on these uh, on independent fostering agencies is that uh, our children end up outside Herefordshire. So we want them to maintain family links, maintain the local schools, which is good for our children. And we have, if we have in-house foster carers, we know the training that we provide, we have more control in terms of the care that our children are, are receiving. Thank you, yes, yeah, so I think we've noted about yeah. asking members to contribute to the panel. Would it, would it be more than one member that would be needed or a couple of ideas? Have you got a thought on that, Gal or anybody? Uh, yeah, I think I'd be very grateful for one. Uh, if, yes. if two or three wanted to do it, because they didn't, they were, because of the time commitment and, and not reading the papers, you, know, you wouldn't expect the same member necessarily to attend every single panel. Okay. So if there were two or three, that would be brilliant because we they could then yes. spread themselves over the year and we would provide training and support for members. Great, thank you. <laughs> Councillor Summers. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, the foster panel activity, do you keep a running total of that? Uh, yes, we do. Okay, can, so the next time, can we have an uh, up-to-date total as we move forward? Um, maybe it'll be six yes, months, I don't know, but it would be Was handy. there something in particular? I mean, I'm not asking for something that you have to go work on, but if it's a running total, it should be fairly simple, I would guess. Thank you. Yes, okay. Thank you. Councillor Jones. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I'd just like to say on these targets, um, when are they measured from? You know, is there, because uh, I know last year we talked at Children's Committee uh, scrutiny that the target was 30. We had the workshop in January, which was talked of 25. And then uh, you just commented earlier, it was 15 until the beginning of April, then, it, then the target would be 25 new foster carers. I just wonder what, what is the, you know, is, is it based on the financial year or what? Um, can you, and can you tell us how many foster carers that have been recruited in the last 12 months or, to, or the, the year that you're targeting? And um, you talked to the marketing, the uh, foster care marketing manager, um, and it's a part-time post now. Can you tell me how many days work that involves or? Yes, that's the easy one. <laughs> uh, 2.5 days per week, but we are seeking to uh, increase that resource to full time if we can. Um, in relation to the number of approvals so far this year, it's 11. And um, in, I've, you might have to repeat your first question for me, sorry. I just, uh, about the, the, when you set these targets, is it like um, a oh, financial yeah. year from March to March or, because the target seems to change quite a bit mm -hmm. and um, I just want to know what that target is for, okay. the, so it can be measured. Yeah, from, uh, prior to my coming into post, as far as I'm aware, the target was 15. I think some of the things that uh, Daryl and I mentioned earlier about um, the situation regarding the need for in-house carers is the reason why it's being re-looked at because we have um, uh, nowhere near really the number of in-house carers we would like to have to be able to meet the need for uh, the, uh, the demand and the need of the children that we look after. So in terms of sufficiency, for example, we would love to be in a position where if a child needs a placement, we're not only looking at one placement but that's very rarely the option. So we want to increase our in-house provision um, so that, that, that we are more sufficient and that we are more independent in terms of where we place our children, that we can place them locally and that we are less dependent on independent fostering agencies, which are much more expensive and outside of the area. Um, so there is also a national shortage of foster carers and so we are, that's another reason why we're trying to increase our in-house number of carers. And that's the reason why it's jumped so significantly. Daryl's anxious in I'll come back to you, Ruth, but Daryl, you wanted to add some. Yeah, it's just it, uh, so the, the, the other point of the question. So it's a uh, financial year, 1st of April to 31st of March. The target for the current year was a net increase of 15, so we've not quite hit that yet. Um, and then uh, we've set ourselves a target for 22, 23. So from the 1st of April, it was a net increase of 25. Thank you, Yeah, that's, okay, that's, yeah just, uh, is the, the marketing manager 
four plus it has, it, has he started that? Is that a role started? Or? Uh, she has, yeah, yeah. And, she's, she's, and yeah. she's doing an amazing job uh, on Twitter and Facebook and the like. Um, yeah, so uh, I follow her and she, and, she, and we, uh, we retweet each other on a regular basis. But the profile for fostering and the fostering service in Herefordshire has uh, really improved uh, since she started. Yeah. Good. Okay. Ruth, you had your hand up. Come down again. Was there one anything, anything you wanted to add? Realize I'm on mute. Uh, Dario has already answered. It was about the financial year, that, that question. I wanted to answer that question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, right, we've had a pretty good debate. Can I something? Do you want to add anything before we go on to recommendations? Um, no, I, I, I was just going to ask about the foster to adopt placements. Um, working with the regional adoption agency is, is, is that active? Are there, do we have? Yes, wait. Yes, wait. Sorry, Ruth, were you going to answer that? Yes, yes, we have, we have a very good relationship uh, with the with our regional adoption agency, and uh, we work very closely with them. And yes, we do have foster to adopt uh, placements. We have not had any difficulties in that area. Thank you. How many okay. in the last year? Do we? I can't say the. Top of my head, but I think I can. We can give. We have the data, but we can. As far as I'm aware, it's six, six, six in the last oh. year. Uh, we are we are hoping to improve that in the future because really we should have around twenty percent of our placements should be foster to adopt. So we we you know uh, the um, the A's do incredibly well in terms of um, adoptions, but we do need to look at how we improve on increasing the number of. Um, foster to adopt placements. Yes, because the more we see of those, the better, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That's Thank the definition Donna. of early permanence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Ruth, for your help and uh, support and presentation. Uh, can I just say, Donna, before I forget, could you send us a copy to the committee of the presentation, please? Yes, of course, I can do that. Thank you. And before to okay. the recommendations, it's a good follow on from the last report we had this a couple of sessions together. So I think we can go on to recommendations. But Diana, did you want to add anything, Councillor Tomboy, before we go on to recommendations? Just thank you again. I'm, I'm I'm really pleased that we're getting on with having elected members on the foster panel. So um, I hope we can really get, get on with that as, because that's an important, you know, another element to the corporate parenting um, yes. role that we talk so much about. And I'm really pleased to see, you know, the, the recruitment and marketing being so active and going out to where people are in libraries and things like that. And the importance of just those informal initial chats. Um, it, it's really, really important. Well, thank you, Councillor. Thank you very much. Two quick points before we go on, because we've got another right to discuss as well. Yeah, Councillor Summers. I would just like um, not so much a report, but I'd like to know what your opinions, both of you actually, on where we can improve. Uh, just don't take it now. I don't want to hear it now, but I would like that to come to us because I'm sure you have your ideas. You've seen, but in another couple of months, you'll have seen what's gone before. You'll have an idea of what is needed. And I'd like to hear what your opinions are of, of where we can improve. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. We can Please do that, put that of course. Down as a recommendation. Councillor uh, Hewitt. So there's a very quick one, really. Um, overnight short break carers, I presume that's the same as respite care placements. There are two sort of there's a suggestion and an inquiry. So the suggestion is that when we have foster carers um, retiring from permanent foster care work, are we recruiting from that cohort for the respite care? Um, um, yeah, there is a slight difference between overnight short break carers and respite carers. So overnight, overnight carers uh, provide placements for children with disabilities. Okay. Um, and they tend to do that with the same family over a period of time to build those relationships and attachments. Uh, respite carers do something very similar, but, but generically uh, for carers. So not just for children with disabilities, but for any carers doing the same thing in terms of offering regular respite, but sometimes emergency respite. Um, uh, for children and young people. So the very last question is, um, when a child's placed in foster care, do they have an allocated, um, either um, the overnight short break care or, or an allocated respite care? Is it somebody who they know? 
they won't tend to know them immediately as they come into care. Um, but if um, if uh, overnight short breaks are required or respite care is required, what we do try to do is to use the same carer for the same family over time so that they can build good relationships, get to know each other and have that ongoing relationship with each other. Okay, thank you very much. Thank You're you, welcome. Matt. Do you have some recommendations to read out to a centre that I can share? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so it's just the two recommendations uh, that the committee promotes the role of elected members of the council to sit on the fostering panel and encourages encourage nominations from current councillors and request that officers from the fostering service provide their assessment of the challenges and opportunities for improvement that exist in the service. Yeah. Um, Do you have a recommendation that we accept the report? Do you review and um, accept the report? So I think that should go in. Do you agree we can take those as a as a group? It's good we have Matthew because mm -hmm. he puts it much better than I could. <laughs> <laughs> the current the current fostering service is currently underway. Can we hear what you're whispering? Yes. So the question was that when we do we know when the next report's due and we want it by? Daryl, can you answer that? So we're planning to write the current for the annual report for the current year. So if we can finish that by so it's the current year is the end of thirty first of March. That will have been written and gone through its internal governance by the end of June. So we'll bring it to you at the at the scrutiny during the summer, whichever is the earliest in terms of your forward work plan. Of course, when you discuss your work plan later this afternoon, yes. um, you yes. could also ask for um, specific information on element, any element of the improvement plan or the service. So you might want to pick up on some of the points that Councillor Summers raises in terms of some of the, you know, the ongoing half-year data, for example, on the fostering panel. Great, thank you. Councillor, so those of you accept all the recommendations then. Yes. Councillor Summers, seconder. Councillor Anson, all those in favour? Thank you. And thank you very much again, Ruth and Diana, for your presentation. And before we move on, <coughs> I think we've, we've covered an awful lot of work today and we've still got one item to do. And we've moved through pretty quickly, but I, I do think it's important before I forget to say thank you to the officers. We've had an absolute mass of four reports, very comprehensive, very detailed, a lot of work that's gone in. So those that are at this meeting and Daryl, those that aren't here but working to please say thanks. Appreciate how much work has gone in within the last minute meeting on this to produce these very comprehensive reports. It's appreciated. Thank you. So let's move on to our intentional the service performance report. This is to provide members of the Children and Young People's Scrutiny Committee with an overview of the range of performance and management information available to managers across the Children and Young People's Directorate. Now it says here we have Charmaine to introduce the report. For you, Darrow, I imagine. As so Charmaine's on annual leave, uh, which is well deserved, she needs a break. Uh, so I'm afraid you've got me uh, yet again this afternoon. Um, so I uh, mentioned in my previous report on the uh, improvement plan earlier that we are currently transitioning away from this style of static snapshot in time reports uh, and moving to a more dynamic online framework. Um, the scorecard that you see here is, is an example of, of one of those snapshot reports. Um, the service has access to a wide range of reports, uh, including a, a national chat, a children's services analysis tool, uh, and, uh, and other tools that we've developed more locally. Um, and these are used to inform uh, decision making and practice improvement. The increasing demand mentioned in an earlier item this afternoon is clearly visible in the scorecard. And this continued through December into January, but appears to be plateauing at that high level now. We, not see, we haven't seen a significant continued rise through January into February, which again, when we bring performance back within your forward work plan, you'll, you'll see the evidence of that. Um, this is clearly impacting on performance, uh, which in some areas of the service continues to improve, and in other areas is poorer than we would like. And so is the focus of further intervention and support at the moment. Um, some of this, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, though, is actually also as a direct consequence of a shift away from former expectations of practice. Uh, so yeah, an example of that was previously the service expected that cases receive supervision once every three months, whereas that's right, we insist that it's every month. Every you know, a, a worker should receive good quality and frequent supervision uh, monthly, and we should be reviewing and, and have a good management oversight on those cases. So some of the performance where you see appears to be poor is also because we've actually tipped some of the expectation around and it'll take a few months really to level out to a level where we 
we expect to see steady and consistent uh, improved in good performance. But I'll assume you've read the report in detail. Uh, I'm conscious of time, so I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Appreciate that. Any questions from members? No, I'm, I'm quite content to uh, wait for a while because it's just a, looks like it's some good things starting to happen. So I just like to see how the future looks. Um, so thank you for the update. Yeah, really look forward yeah. to anything, anything for me, uh, and I've only been in since 2015, it's better than what we've had in the past. So I like what I hear and I just hope it continues. Thank you. Uh, again, I mean, in, in the spirit of complete openness and transparency, which is, uh, which is, I think, going to define my leadership here, some of the performance that you'll see in here is poor. Um, but I think if we take it in the spirit of it's a benchmark report, much like one of the other earlier reports, and that you, uh, I trust that you would want to see marked improvement when we bring it back to you in the future. Do you want to see the red arrows, We will hold you to that, Darren. I'm afraid I'm used to, uh, it's not your business, basically. Don't look at the schools, don't look at this, don't look at mental health. And uh, it's now we've come to the point where we have to look at, it suggests we look at everything, which is what I like. And thank you very much for that. I'm not trying to rush on, but is there anything you want to add, Councillor Jones? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just, it's disappointing to see the figures in um, children in, in care has risen from March 2021 to when it was 312, <laughs> and it's up to November, it's gone to 345. And I always make a point when I'm talking to my parish councils, because they're quite interested in me sitting on the children's scrutiny, but it's, um, they've sort of seen it creep down, but at, at least you're, you're um, you know, it's being honest, you're not manipulating the figures and you're telling it as it is. So um, I sort of welcome that, but it, it's going to be disappointed after to say it's, it's crept up. And, and, I can, and you have put the reasons there because children are in care longer and, and yeah. So, uh, but I, that's only comment. Uh, thank you. Yeah. And, and so I think we, all, we're all, we would all, I think, uh, wish to see fewer children coming into our care. Um, so uh, the initiatives that we're developing at the minute is to uh, develop our edge of care services going forward so that we can prevent more children coming into care where that's appropriate and also for some children who come into care uh, as a crisis in a family uh, that we uh, support the family and then try to get the, the child reunited back with their family again so we're developing a range of initiatives uh, at the minute to, to strengthen that uh, response going forward. Um, we're, we're actually not seeing significant, a significant rise in the rate at which children come into care. But what we haven't got is many that are coming up towards their 18th birthday or going out the other end. So you see a net increase because that's fact there are fewer going out of our care at the minute. So that's something we're very focused on to make sure that children um, that come into care. We, 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 I guess we need to have the assurance that the right children, the children who need to be in our care for a period of time, come into our care and not get too long up on the numbers. But then make sure that we're reuniting families where we can. And that's our focus at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. You guys. I just, you know, actually, I'd like to answer Mike on that one because I think because of the domestic abuse issues that have gone up, skyrocketed since COVID, and more children are in between their parents, I think uh, the, the, the increase is not too bad if we really look. I know we don't want any increase, no, no. but for two years of COVID and all the domestic abuse that we're hearing about, uh, I'd expect the figures to be higher. So I'm quite content at the moment. I think when COVID starts to die down, I think we should be looking at lowering figures. But to push, put pressure on right now, I think is maybe wrong. But just my feeling. Thank you. It might be something you tell you at Parish Council. Mm. Thank you very much. Do you yeah. have any comments? Uh, yeah, this is a very basic one. Each one of these pieces of data here has um, a whole raft of telling on it some of which I can quickly access. But actually, we have asked for data unpacking, um, instruction, tuition, help. And I would really appreciate it because, you know, I'm looking at this and we're still on a learning curve with the different categories of children in need, children, um, child protection plans, et cetera, et cetera. And so we're navigating all of that at the same time as looking at data, which, you know, I want to be able to unpack it more intelligently. I'm sure it's not that I can't, but I would 
I need help with it. I don't know whether any other committee members felt the same about all the graphs and data, but I think it would be helpful for the whole committee. Just before you come back, Carol, we did say <coughs> in very early that scrutiny needs better equipment to do the job. Yeah. Um, and some of the aspects of it are you know, a gramogram, which you've now sent us across the new terms. Um, but in particular, we also said greater skills in analysis of reports and in particular data. And we did agree urgently we need a training session and data and in our own data now we interpret it and our own data compares to the statistical neighbors so we can compare how we're doing. You've offered to do that. I know we're all pressed, but we do need to bring that forward as a, a matter of urgency. Now we are getting better quality and more data. We need even better skills to interpret it and ask pertinent questions. So can we get that set up as soon as possible, please? I'm sorry, I interrupted, but important point to make your point. Uh, no, I'm happy to facilitate uh, a workshop because again, if we're going to look at that performance framework, it'd be easy to look at the performance as well in, in all of that and help help uh, members with that. Um, um, you're absolutely right. There's a lot of data there, and and, uh, and and what we're happy to do is more move towards a more narrative style, which explains what the data is and how we, how we compare with others. Certainly happy to do that going forward. Uh, I think uh, in the recommendation, members are also asked um, to kind of give us a. We could either just give you the whole lot every three months, or however however often you want to see it, or we could do focused deep dive type reports into you know, look after children, children need child protection. Uh, and other elements of this. So again, when you consider your forward work plan, you, you might want to consider, um, or meet with Matthew and myself, and, and consider how you might want to see the performance data possibly broken down over the year, so you can uh, uh, explore it in yeah, a bit more yeah. detail. Yeah. In fact, I've got a thought about that when we come to the work programme to put forward to the committee. Uh, Councillor Fagan, I don't know whether you want to add anything before we move on to re recommendation. No, I'm, I'm fine, thank you. You. And uh, can I count this on? Is anything you wanted to add? No, thanks. Great. Recommendations, then, please, Matt, that we captured for us. Well, I don't know if you want me to share it on screen. I've just got the one, and that was uh, to request a workshop development session on understanding and analysing the safeguarding and family support scorecard. Yeah. Well, it's, it's data analysis generically as well as that one particularly. Yeah. Let me use this one to go on. Yeah. And of course, that we. We see the report um, as well, we should put that in the course of the season of the report. It does say to identify any specific areas of performance the committee would wish to receive reports on. I think we need to come back to that in the work program. So that's two recommendations. Can I just, I just ask, it didn't work again. All right, so that's the question. Is a lot of this, a lot of these stats, I'm very bad with stats by the way, so I'll tell you right up front. Um, and, I think a lot of people out there are just as bad as me. Is this for residents or is it for us? Because if residents read this, I don't, and I must, I'm not putting down our residents, it's just very difficult to get through. I prefer something that, that tells me the kind of a story or something, but to put all this stuff down, it's good for you, you need it because that's what the central government wants and you have to send it to them. But I just wanna know the nuts and bolts. And I think most people wanna know the nuts and bolts. So. We need, if we, like um, Mike has his parish council very interested, so if he can have the nuts and bolts, it's going to be easier for him too. So all this technical jargon is great for you, but not for me, sorry. Uh, and, um, and I'm happy to move to a more narrative style uh, report going forward, but I think, uh, Chair, if I may, I think there was a third recommendation. Uh, I think uh, Councillor Summers was, was holding me to account for wanting to see improvement as the year goes on, and I'm happy to be challenged by scrutiny on that level. So um, yeah. we said this was a bench line report uh, and we need to be coming to you demonstrating improvement as the year goes on. I think we can address that in the work programme, uh, maybe having workshops to actually determine what it is particularly we want to challenge you on down. I mean, uh, can I just say, <laughs> for instance, this is a for instance, what would help um, for me, because we're still on a learning curve in children's scrutiny, is it says strategy discussions. Now, I believe that a strategy discussion happens when it's um, a complex safeguarding issue. Am I right? Is it section 47? It's at the point where uh, professionals believe there's an a, 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 a imminent or significant risk of harm to a child and you have a multi agency. So, so what would help quite right. at, at the top of here is that description so that 
I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I'm anxious that I've got this right. So I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, oh, and then we've got a score. I can see 86 out of 189 are on time scale, which is really, you know, I know that lots of this data is pretty sad. You know, I can tell that, but it takes me quite a while to get to that point. I want to be able to go, oh, ping, ping, ping. You know, I've got what that's talking about. So we need a bit more help here. Noted. I think in answer to your question, Councillor Summers, your, what you said there about providing some narrative and to go alongside the data, I think oversimplifying the data would mean we probably couldn't pursue in depth as much as the questions we want to ask. So I think in answer to your question, I think the training is for us. So we have better skills in interpreting complex data and ask us, then ask the questions which make it simpler for those listening to understand the key points we're making. So I think it's that bridge between relatively complex data, us having the skills to look at it and pick out the key points and ask the questions that the public can understand right. are the key points that we're scrutinising. Yeah. So but at the end it. of the day, I think most of that material is for central government and it's mandated. So you have to keep those records, I think. Is that the case? I could be wrong. Uh, many of the key performance indicators are driven by government legislation yeah. and government guidance. So that you're going to be doing but this, this. But this particular document and this style of document um, it was, it was produced in the past for internal consumption. Not, not to, we do we do an annual census okay. uh, return for government. Okay, great, thank you. Right, map the recommendations in the okay. well, 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 I think there are three now. I've got to put them up on screen. Yeah, thank you. Right. But, uh, as, as they stand currently, um, so the committee was received. Receive and approve the children's performance report. Um, request the workshop development session on understanding, analysing, and safeguarding family support scorecard to also include an overview and examination of other data sets used by the committee. Okay. Um, and then uh, uses the current report as a ben benchmark against which the performance of the service will be judged during the course of the year. Are you happy with that? No, it's an easier narrative. That's not. Oh. At the end of the day, we still need that, don't we? Yeah. Yes, we need the data, but along so we need an easier narrative. narrative. To so yes. yes. Quite a good point. Because I'm done. Yeah. But okay. I'm, I'm old too, so I can't take it all in all the time. I don't quite understand. Words of one syllable. So now we've had yeah. now a narrative will support the presentation. Yeah. yeah. Right. Are we all happy with those? Thank right? you, Matthew. Yeah. Right. Are we all happy with them? Perhaps somebody proposed we accept them. Can't answer. A seconder. Council oh, Jones, all in favour? Great. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you again to the officers for all the reports you produced and all the hard work and uh, presenting your talk to us. So we've got through an awful lot today. All keeping our concentration, which we've done, is commendable. And thank you for all that. Now, the last item is the work programme review and tracking the recommendations. And we have got quite a comprehensive report here. I'd like to suggest to the committee that actually, I think this is an ideal subject for a uh, the task and finish group, taking into account your suggestion, Daryl, you and Matthew. We had a really good set, we've had a couple of really good sessions where we went to the work program in a small group and then recommended and then come back to the committee. Mm -hmm. And I think there's also a lot of work we need to look at the action tracker. There's quite a lot of actions we need to review and look at to bring forward to the committee in future meetings. So I'd like to suggest that we look at the next meeting, which we're proposing is about mental health and it's dedicated to mental health issues and um, we do work between now and then to reduce reports on different aspects of mental health but in the meantime we have a task and finish group which looks at future work items for the committee including bringing forward the tracker items that we need to review and uh, the workshop on data analysis fostering updates and some other take all that into account and come forward with a, a comprehensive proposed work program for the future would that work for members? Uh, yes. Uh, what I would like to see in the work program, if it's possible, uh, over the past four years, five years, there's been a number of tasks and finished. Not a lot. But there's been a couple. Matthew knows the most of them. Yeah. If we could get that material, because a lot of it wasn't followed through by the cabinet exactly. at that time, I think it would be useful reading for us and would give us an idea where we need to go. A little bit further, just a thought. No, it's very good when you pack it up. It does go back at least a year. Mm -hmm. You go even further back than that. Yeah, the recommendation. So like there's just up. some good stuff like there is. on send and all that kind of stuff that we did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. what I mentioned. I'm very mindful that we need to go back and look at the tracker. 
happy to hit one thing, but it's probably not they're actually doing it, including our back. Yeah. And I know one of the issues in the approval plan, there were some recommendations and nobody really to blame, but mm -hmm. there wasn't a system of following through. And we've now introduced the action tracker to make sure we capture that, but we also need to go a step further and make sure it actually happens as well. So first of all, I propose that we agree that the next meeting on 22nd of March is mental health focus. You know I'm going to agree. <laughs> and uh, we also, between now and the next meeting, arrange a workshop between myself, Vice Chair, Carol, Matthew, probably just those four, to work out an ongoing work programme, taking into account workshops needed, reports needed to look at, the action tracker going back, and just put together an action plan tied to when we should be getting reports and being in the report. This is quite complicated. Can I? You said the task can finish initially, and then yeah. you say, No, you're saying to you. Yeah. Well, did I confuse? Sorry, I meant the task can finish. Yes. Okay. Can I just throw something for you to keep in mind on that yeah. in our program? Um, some of the schools, primary schools, have good policies, others not so good. And I'm just wondering how much we can get gleaned from them if we could have a task and finish on what. Uh, it, it could come out in the mental health but, and what they're doing for the well-being of their students. I know, for example, Ledbury School, primary school does a really good job. They have it all set up. If, if every school did what they were doing, we, it would be great. So I'm just wondering if, you know, all the schools that we have in the county, that we look at what they're doing well, for well-being. Some yeah. good practice. Some good practice. And, you know, it's just something that I think yeah, yeah. It hasn't been done, but it could be done. No, we, we... Yeah, now we're talking about we need to exercise our ability to help individuals with specific sessions yeah. uh, to get their mental health as well. Though. So if you can send that in the email to us, so catch it, we'll be putting that as an action item in the next. I'll have to look back on my own And I think if any members have suggestions of where they've seen good practice yeah. for mental health in schools yeah, exactly. or or elsewhere, then um, mental health provision for children, then um, make that recommendation and we'll invite that, that person. Thank you, Matt. You were going to. Yes, and sorry, just to clarify the, um, the business planning session that you'd uh, yeah. envisaged, and uh, yeah. you mentioned it would be a task and finish group. Yeah, I don't um, know. I, I think I'd, I'd be minded to simplify it and just have a business planning yeah. Yeah. Um, session yeah. between Whatever. you and the. Yeah, the word you might like is Matthew. Matthew. Sorry, Matthew. Uh, it, it just needs to be, Daryl doesn't need to be our, our rep said Daryl for that business plan day. Say that again, sorry. Our, our rep said Daryl for the business plan okay. day. It just yeah. it makes it easy to dive from time. Just three of us, maybe the chair, vice chair, how do you do that? I'm sure that was happy. Okay, great. Uh, that's that's fine. fine. It will be. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're really busy, Daryl, and we shouldn't put your time necessarily. Uh, did you have one hand in that line? My suggestions. Did you want to add anything to those suggestions? No, no, I'm happy with that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Time. Councillor Fagan. I I'm all for a business planning meeting rather than a task and finish. I think yeah. that makes good sense. Yeah, it was my turn. I'll do the week to that. Councillor Hewitt, would you like to? to are there any members who particularly like to be at that meeting? Who are <laughs> Good at picking over past detail and going, hang on, we've left that behind, you know, that sort of. Yeah, I was going to make the same point. It doesn't have to be just chair and vice chair and Matthew. Anyway, if anyone wants to come forward, do feel free. We'll let you know the date. Matthew will fix up a date with you. Yeah. And then we'll let people know. And if you want to come along, you'd be very welcome. Diana, did you want to add anything to any reports on the work program? Was that me you were asking? Yes, it was, yes. Come yeah. Forward. um. No, thanks. But just on the, you know, um, we we have asked for, as I put in the chat, mapping of what, what already exists in schools in Herefordshire in the way of emotional support for children and students. And um, it's very frustratingly um, difficult to get a clear picture because of all the different, you know, funding streams and short term programs and schemes. And, you know, I find that quite frustrating. But um, we are putting together a picture at the moment. So that be something we can bring to the next meeting in March. Then. That's the plan. Okay, great. Thank you. Councillor, you, you want to add another? Point? Well, I was just wondering. Um, 
when a councillor Toynbee was um, going through the school's mental health forum to collect that detail? Or... I don't know. I'll have to ask Kerry and Les, you know, I don't, I don't know. Okay, because Kath and I were at a presentation from the school's mental health forum and they seem to know quite a lot, so they might know about what schools are doing. Yeah, definitely. And it's Kath who's um, sort of um, overseeing all this, yeah. So I'll remind her, thanks. Thank you. So I think we've got two recommendations now. One that we agree the next meeting on the 22nd of March will be about mental health. Secondly, the business planning meeting, which is included in the chair, vice chair, and Matthew, at least with other members joining us if they wish. Okay, those are, we accept that as the way forward and work program. Mm -hmm. Councillor Summers, seconder, Councillor Jones, all in favour? That's unanimous, thank you very much. The date of the next meeting is Tuesday, 22nd of March, 2022 at 2.30. Thank you all for attending. And finally, can I inform you because the meeting, or before I do, can I please check with the Democratic Services team that the live stream has been switched